Earth is our home. It provides space to live. It makes diversity possible. And it gives us a sense of security. But our actions threaten the ecosystems. Air pollution is a health burden for many people worldwide. Our consumption outstrips the planet's natural resources. Growing amounts of waste are threatening our ecosystems. Ecological cycles are becoming disrupted. Intensive land use threatens biodiversity and ultimately our source of nutrition. Valuable space is being lost forever. But we hold the future in our own hands. Knowledge becomes awareness. Awareness makes action possible. Every single one of us makes a difference. People worldwide are stepping into action to protect the environment and nature. Researchers get to the bottom of causes. Education is becoming more and more important and sustainability is taught in school. The circular economy is taking shape. More and more sustainable solutions are being developed and are changing our lives. But we still don't know or do enough. How can green innovation make a large-scale breakthrough? How can we make a change to live more sustainably? Our common goal is set. We do research for a climate-neutral Europe. We are committed to a workable circular economy. We establish sustainability in education, enable participation and promote change in behaviour. Together. Dear participants of the European Forum on Science and Education for Sustainability, my name is Alexander Geerst and I'm a European Space Agency astronaut and I recently was commander of the International Space Station Expedition 57. I would like to welcome Minister Karliczek and participants from all around Europe. I would love to be there with you today to discuss the importance of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. As an ESA astronaut, I had twice the opportunity to see our pale blue dot from space. I spent 360 days, almost a year, on board the International Space Station, ISS, and despite my extensive scientific work schedule, I found some time to look down on our beautiful planet Earth. What I saw was both fascinating and frightening. Like Probably every single other human being that ventured to space before and after me, I was clearly not prepared for this new perspective. To see deliberate forest fires, floods and even war with my own eyes from space is very different than seeing those pictures on television. The view from space makes it brutally clear that every single resource on this small blue planet is finite and that its ecosystem, our livelihood, is made from a fragile complexity. The only way to keep it functioning is to act responsible, which ultimately means to act sustainable. The support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is therefore high on our agenda at the European Space Agency. It plays a vital role in our activities like Earth observation, navigation, space transportation, and space safety. And of course, to make life better on Earth is the ultimate goal of our work as astronauts when we perform a multitude of scientific experiments on every one of our missions and when we bring back the perspective 
of a human being looking back at their fragile home planet. It is my dream that every person, company, and organization, be it governmental or industrial, shows awareness to the importance of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Everyone can do her or his part to make the world a better place. With this dream in mind, I wish you an inspiring and successful forum today. All the best. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the European Forum on Science and Education for Sustainability. My name is Elke Fink, and I can only agree with my previous speaker, Alexander Gerst. The future lies in our hands, and it's definitely time for action. Our goal, as the conference motto already indicates, is to take an important step together, moving from ambition to action by successfully connecting research and education to write the future and to shape a smarter and better connected world, a world where safety, sustainability and efficiency are more relevant than ever. When shaping the future, it is crucial to take a look at the present from as many point of views as possible. So we started this day from moving words from Alexander Gerst, stating that looking down on our beautiful planet from outer space has changed his view of things profoundly. Well, let's add another dimension, so to say. Let's travel together to a place where climatic changes can be felt more clearly than anywhere else in the world. Let's get aboard the greatest Arctic expedition of all time. The research vessel Polar Stern has been exploring the world's polar regions since 1982, for example, to improve understanding of climate change. The Polar Stern spends an average of 310 days at sea each year. Last autumn, it embarked on the biggest Arctic expedition ever undertaken, known as Mosaic. Around 300 researchers, representing over 70 institutions from 20 countries, are taking part in this mission. We want to introduce you to some of them. Here at Mosaic, I'm part of the eco team. Uh, my interests are mainly in carbon chemistry. I'm an oceanographer researching into the deep sea and why it's warming. I work for the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, which is part of the Department of Energy in the United States. I'm here to study how the changing sea ice and uh, snow precipitating over the changing sea ice is reflect reflecting solar irradiance back to the space. In my PhD, I'm actually working with data here from this expedition. So I'm really happy to see how the data that I'm working with, I can put in context with, all, with the whole camp and all the people working on the different tasks. Frozen within an ice flow, the Polar Stern is drifting right across the Arctic with a central research camp and an extensive network of monitoring stations. The ship, which was specially designed for polar research missions, is fitted with equipment for various scientific purposes. All the participants take home incredible memories and experiences. There are so many single tasks, but it's getting so complex um, joining these tasks together and this really impressed me. Every day when you work together with people from different teams, you see how interconnected all of the work that we're doing is. So the atmosphere affects the ice, the ice affects the ocean, the ocean affects the biology, and the biology in the ocean then affects the atmosphere. So everything is really interconnected, and it's really cool to be in the field and see that. I saw my first polar bear during this expedition in her natural environment in the middle of massive sea ice field and I think it's something I will remember the rest of my life. Changes in the Arctic are closely linked to global weather patterns. The data from the research carried out in the Arctic provides the basis for improved understanding of climate change. Measurements taken at altitudes of up to 35,000 meters 
and at depths of down to 4,000 meters, provide valuable data to improve our understanding of complex climate processes. And this is already helping to identify the areas in which action needs to be taken. We have to understand all the processes and together to be able to piece them all together because everything is related. You can't just change one thing and expect everything else to stay the same. It's a dynamic system and everything is going to affect everything else. It's sort of important to always have a certain amount of curiosity about what you do. If you have an idea, maybe just like a thought you have about something you'd like to do for climate or something you want to do to get involved, and if you just mention it to the people around you, you don't even have to say it with the intention for it to go somewhere, but just talking about it, that's what gets the ball rolling. The responsibility to act for climate change is all of ours, and in best case, the actions that we take for climate change are based on science. Wow, I mean, moving words and impressive pictures. I'd like to now give a warm welcome, so to say, to, with me live on stage, the cruise leader of the third leg of the Mosaic Expedition. Welcome, Professor Dr. Thorsten Kanzel. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a big pleasure for me. <sighs> Professor Kanzel, it's a very impressive statement we heard at the end. Decisions should be based on science. How did you experience this uh, extraordinary expedition? Was this, uh, what was the most uh, significant scientific finding or observation you brought home? Yeah, I was on board uh, on the third leg of, of Mosaic. So that was in the, the late winter and transition to summer period. Um, and uh, for me, that was, I guess, for, on a personal level, it was uh, the most demanding and, and most complex expedition I had the honor to lead. And I think it was, was a big honor to, to be able to be out there in the winter uh, on the ice and, and following the, the, the process work that we were doing. Um, it was, it was uh, a complex because we had already five weeks past us when we arrived on Polarstern, uh, traveling with the uh, Kapitan Dranitz in a Russian icebreaker towards Polarstern uh, through the polar uh, night. Uh, when we arrived there, it was, uh, it was uh, very, very cold, minus 40 degrees. Getting, it was very hard to start to work. Uh, the ice was mobile, the infrastructures keep moving. So we were uh, very, very busy keeping it all running, keeping the time series running, because like we saw in the, in the trailer, um, it was important to measure all these complex interactions between the different compartments of the climate system, the ocean, the ice, the snow, uh, the, the air. Uh, and I think we, we, we managed in the end, but it was a, was, was a very, very enduring uh, period. Um, and I think it's, uh, you asked me about the most important result, and I think it's, it's important to understand that I think the most important results will come out in, in a few years mm -hmm. of time. It, it takes actually a lot of time to digest all the data, to analyze all the data. We, we, we saw important elements. We saw how the snow was distributed on the ice, which is an important insulator between the atmosphere and, and, and the ice. Uh, that was uh, um, a very important uh, measurement, basically. We saw how the ocean changed throughout the period of, of observations. Uh, we, we saw the ice growing and then uh, the sudden onset of the melt, uh, which was not a gradual onset, but a very sudden one, uh, the transition from winter to summer. Th these are very, very important elements, but we need to piece them together now uh, mm -hmm. to get a consistent picture. And that's what Mosaic is about, piecing the processes together and get them into the climate models. Thank you. Well, talking about difficult circumstances, uh, we now hopefully have a connection right aboard the Polarstern. And I would like to welcome via satellite telephone the expedition leader, Professor Dr. Markus Rex. Uh, Mr. Rex, can you hear us? I hear a little. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Amazing. So, where exactly are you positioned right now? Right now, we are at seven. Right now, he is. Where is he exactly right now? 
So, so he is uh, south of Spitsbergen at the moment um, in, in the Nordic seas. Mm -hmm. So they, are, they have left the ice. They are traveling uh, home towards uh, Bremerhaven now. And they are expected to be there early next week. Early next are. week already? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So once out of the ice, it gets a lot smoother and faster. <laughs> yeah, it gets faster. That's right. <laughs> Let's see if we can establish the connection once again. Um, in the meantime, um, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. um, well, we all know the disappearance of the polar ice caps, mostly only from the uh, media coverage, or maybe from the words of uh, Mr. Gast. But um, what affected you when you've seen it with your own eyes on site? Um, so we were, as I said, uh, we, uh, we were out there in the, in the middle of the winter, or the, in the end of, uh, of the winter, actually. Um, and we were, um, uh, we were measuring the seasonal growth of ice, which occurs in winter normally. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, our, um, our goal was really to, to keep these measurements going in these difficult conditions that we experienced there. So our day-to-day -day thinking was really about technical things, keeping the whole thing going, uh, getting the teams in action, uh, having them uh, do their work on the ice. Um, and it was uh, only during a few moments where, where one uh, could uh, basically say lean back a little bit and, and enjoy the beautiful nature, for instance, when we were occasionally traveling with the helicopter to remote stations uh, where we had automated measurements going on that needed calibration. So we were going out there with the helicopter. It dropped us there and we were then left alone for some time to do our measurements. And in those periods, I think it was uh, when we were felt how we were exposed to nature and, uh, and um, how, how beautiful it actually is. Yes. Um, so, since we do not have a connection, or is he again online? Okay, perfectly. So, Mr. Rex, I hope you can hear us again. Um, I would like to know what impressions and what material you will be bringing home from your trip. Yes, I'm back online because I connected to the article, not what it is the rest of the world. We bring back about 150 terabytes of data and countless samples of snow, ice, water, air, and ecosystem species. It is a treasure for science. Uh, data and samples from the North Pole region where we have never been with the modern research icebreaker during winter before. And we are full of impressions that will stay with us for the rest of our lives. Being out there on the sea ice during the half year on polar night in the little bubble of light on our own headlamps. Drawn by the complete darkness of the polar night and several ice formations far away from any other human. It really often felt like being on a different planet. Wow, okay, so what are the next steps when you come back to Bremerhaven? What will happen then? We have data and samples from many years of groundbreaking research now. Uh, we will now analyze the data, understand the Arctic climate system, and represent its processes and interactions in our climate models. And we are all ambassadors from the Arctic now. We are keen on sharing our impressions and insights with all the people who have not been so fortunate to see with uh, their own eyes how it looks like in the Arctic. And this will keep us busy for so many years to come. Um, in winter, the Arctic is still a deeply frozen landscape, but the thickness of the ice has only been half of what it used to be 40 years ago, and the temperatures have been nearly 10 degrees Celsius higher than what Friedrich Nansen encountered in his expedition about 125 years ago. And then in summer, we have seen the ice dying. We sailed right to the North Pole uh, through vast stretches of open water. At the cold itself, the ice was completely molten and eroded. The Arctic is the epicenter of global warming and the ice is dying. And if we do not reduce the greenhouse gas emissions massively, if we fail to reduce them to near zero by mid of the century, the summer Arctic ice will disappear and uh, then we will be the last generation which can see it. If we fail, the Arctic will be a different world for future generations and that will have massive consequences for the climate where we live. And this is about every single one of us. In our democracies, we have the fantastic freedom for everybody to decide about our future. Uh, but this comes along with the responsibility for everybody to protect the interests of future generations and to understand the consequences of our decisions to and to take this responsibility. Our will provide the uh, scientific path and uh, the insight uh, that we bring back from the Arctic.
think we're losing the connection here. It's a little unsafe. <laughs> so maybe you can sum it up a little bit in your words uh, if uh, the yeah. rest was uh, not clearly to be understood <laughs> in the end. <laughs> yeah, that brings back some memories. I made many phone calls that, that were interrupted when I was on the, on the sure. expedition. Um, so, I mean, what, what uh, Professor Rex outlined was uh, basically that, that they were experiencing ex very, very loose ice conditions towards the end of the, the expedition. And, um, and he um, uh, uh, outlined that, uh, that this is, of course, uh, to be seen in this context of the long-term decline of, of the Arctic sea, uh, sea ice. And the summer sea ice extent over the past 40 years has shrunk by 40%. Uh, so it's a, it's a dramatic change that we're experiencing in the Arctic. Uh, and um, those were the conditions that allowed Polar then to get back in the summer towards the North Pole without much... Uh, um, problems. So they faced uh, very different conditions than we had them in, in winter when we were out there. Okay, okay. Mm. So um, summing that up a little bit, we can clearly say it's not just longer 5 to 12, it's rather 5 seconds <laughs> to 12, so to say. What uh, do you as a scientist expect or, or ask from, from politics, from economy, what must happen now? Yeah, you're, you're right in saying that it's, it's very late in the day to, to do something, but it's worthwhile doing uh, m many things. And I think that the one realization that we, we need to uh, make sure politics has it on board is that we have enough scientific facts presented uh, uh, that we know what are the causes of climate change. Uh, that, that is pretty sure, and we also have a lot of knowledge into what might happen. So, so we need to act, that's pretty sure. And from politics, I think I would, would like to see two things. Uh, one, one is to, uh, to spread optimism and to make society aware of the fact and also economy aware of the fact that there are many chances in acting and in, in, in um, coping with, uh, with, with the challenge towards uh, a pathway to, to zero greenhouse gas emissions, for instance. That would be one, one important aspect. Um, and, and the, the other is also to understand by society and, and politics that not everything is known about climate change. And there are still important um, things to be understood. Uh, and uh, and this, this uh, remaining uncertainty is something that, that politics and society needs to cope with. Um, and I hope that in the future um, we will have a kind of an understanding that more basic uh, climate-related research is necessary in order to narrow down these uncertainties of our future projections. And that is what Mosaic is about. That's the core of, of Mosaic, basically. And I hope that, that uh, the politics will make it possible for other expeditions, other um, settings where, where scientists can work to, to help uh, reduce our uncertainties in the, in the future uh, projections. We will be having uh, our minister speaking to us uh, very soon, mm -hmm. but uh, since we still have a little time uh, after the connection broke down, I have a more personal question. I'm just interested in what is life like on board of, of, of such a ship? You've been talking about minus 40 degrees, for instance. Yeah, on, on the ship it's cozy, it's nice and warm, <laughs> uh, so, so you, don't, uh, you don't experience any, any cold. Um, you have, uh, we had a very strict working pattern uh, on the ship, which was important because we were working uh, every day in, in the week, and it was important to keep a certain schedule so that people wouldn't overburden uh, themselves with the work. So we were having our breakfast every day at the same time, okay. uh, our lunch, we were coming home from the ice for lunch when it was possible, we were going out again, and we were stopping at some time uh, in the evening. Uh, so that everybody could also get a rest and also digest the data they, they um, basically collected. So there, there's um, a, a fixed rhythm in, in, in the work that was really necessary to keep this going over months uh, uh, when we were out there. Uh, apart from that, of course, you also have time to spend your free time there. You have a pool on Polar Stern. You have a Inside. Sa and sauna. <laughs> you have a sauna. <laughs> We played football on the ice. Uh, there, there were also, we had barbecue at minus 30 degrees. Oh, wow. There, there were also these, these experiences that, that were important for these teams too. 
Well, that's, that sounds actually quite quite nice. Uh, <laughs> but um, how, how how do your families cope with that? I mean, we just uh, realized how mm. difficult it is to communicate with the rest of the world. Yes, um, and it it was. Um, actually more difficult when, when we were on board because then Cologne, Corona struck and we were not being uh, able to, to get back in the way we, we had planned to come back. Okay. Um, uh, so it was both difficult for them to cope with the situation, with us being uh, only uh, able to, to, to communicate in a limited way. WhatsApp worked for some time. Okay. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, the other way was also that we were having a hard time to understand what was going on in the rest of the world, uh, where we were in the safest place, basically, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, from a corona perspective, at least. So that was, uh, that was a, a difficult time for some of the participants on board. Uh, some were uh, coping extremely well with the long delays that we had, mm -hmm. um, the, lo the uh, changing of the plans that happened all the time. But some were also not coping so well, and uh, so that was also... Um, yeah, a lot of endurance was, was necessary to keep yes. the spirit up. Also, our technical team is uh, suffering a lot of endurance problems, I think, <laughs> at the moment. But I think we again have a connection to the Polarstern. Mr. Rex, can you hear us? I can hear you again. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I just like to know, as a final question, what are your your personal um, or what are the effects your experiences in the Arctic do have on your personal life, and what also, if we still have the time, are your expectations from politics? Yeah, for me, living on the sea for almost nine months during the last year has led to a very close, uh, even emotional connection to this fascinating environment and to the ice in the Arctic. Um, it has been sad to see uh, the status of the ice, particularly in summer when the warm summer led to the erosion and the melt of the ice. Um, it was obvious um, that we are right now on track for a uh, ice-free Arctic in summer. Um, it requires urgent action now to prevent that. If we lose the sea ice in the Arctic in summer, it will have uh, massive consequences for weather and climate uh, in the areas where we live. The Arctic uh, is the region where many of our weather systems are generated. The temperature contrast between the Arctic and our latitudes drives the main weather patterns and uh, atmospheric circulation on the northern hemisphere. So it is now time to act, and this is my expectation, of course, uh, to, to the politics, uh, to the leaders of our countries. Um, they need to listen to the scientific facts, to the scientific understanding, and then take the action uh, which are required uh, to prevent that future, to prevent uh, the loss of the Arctic sea ice, uh, and to save it for the future generations. Thank you very much. Yes, I think the time is now, now or never, actually. Um, thank you very much, and thank you also for your patience, for, for calling us three times. And um, we do wish you a safe journey back to Bremerhaven. And uh, yeah, we are looking forward to the results. Professor Kanzler, thank you also very much for your time, for coming here and okay. uh, sharing your impressions with us. Yeah, thanks thank for much. giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Well, um, we have a lot on our agenda today, literally and figuratively, so let's get down to work. For the official conference opening, ladies and gentlemen, also our audience uh, at home, please welcome on stage the Federal Minister of Education and Research, Mrs. Anja Kalicek. Ja, schönen guten Morgen hier aus Berlin. Wir wollen Europa bis 2050 zum ersten klimaneutralen Kontinent machen. Und die Bilder, die Sie gerade alle gesehen haben von der Mosaik-Expedition, haben, finde ich, sehr eindrücklich gezeigt, warum das so wichtig ist. In der Arktis schmilzt das Eis und Europa hat eben auch zunehmend unter den Auswirkungen unseres Klimas 
zu leiden. Ich glaube, wir spüren das alle im Moment und auch schon seit einiger Zeit in unserem Alltag. Und deswegen arbeiten ganz viele Mitgliedstaaten und auch die EU-Kommission daran, dass wir zu einer effektiveren und eben auch zu einer ehrgeizigeren Klimapolitik kommen und uns auch ehrgeizigere Ziele vornehmen. Und genau deswegen heißt heute das Motto der Konferenz From Ambition to Action. Gemeinsam mit Ihnen wollen wir nämlich ein innovatives und ein nachhaltiges Europa schaffen. Denn am Ende ist genau so ein Europa auch ein sehr starkes Europa in der Welt. Nur ein starkes Europa wird den existenziellen und auch den globalen Herausforderungen gerecht werden können und seinen eigenen Beitrag dazu leisten. Die Basis am Ende ist dafür, dass eine exzellente Bildung und Forschungslandschaft da ist, dass der europäische Green Deal funktioniert und dass es auch technologische und soziale Innovationen im Sinne der 17 Nachhaltigkeitsziele der Agenda 2030 gibt. Ich will heute zwei Initiativen rausgreifen, mit denen wir diese Ziele in die Tat umsetzen. Wir wollen Europa zum Kontinent des grünen Wasserstoffs machen. Und dafür starten wir eine Forschung und Innovationsinitiative. Wir wollen den grünen Wasserstoff wirtschaftlich nutzen und auch produzieren können. Europa soll weltweiter Innovationsführer und auch Leitmarkt für grüne Wasserstofftechnologien werden. Und dafür arbeiten wir ganz eng mit der Europäischen Kommission zusammen. Eine zweite Initiative, die wir in ganz enger europäischer Zusammenarbeit auf den Weg gebracht haben, ist die Initiative Plastic Pirates Go Europe. Jugendliche aus Deutschland, aus Portugal und aus Slowenien sammeln dafür Plastikmüll an Seen, an Flüssen und am Meer. Und am Ende geht es darum, den Forscherinnen und Forschern damit eine Basis zur Verfügung zu stellen, die sie dann analysieren können, dass sie das Mikro- und das Makroplastik des gesammelten Abfalls dann analysieren. So lernen am Ende die Jugendlichen die Zusammenarbeit für Forschung über Grenzen hinweg bereits in der Schule kennen. Und so setzen wir eben Bildungsprojekte für mehr Nachhaltigkeit um. Gemeinsam mit der Europäischen Kommission wollen wir diese Initiative dann auch in der ganzen EU durchführen. Und je mehr Länder sich beteiligen, desto kompletter wird das Bild der Plastikverschmutzung in unseren Gewässern. Und am Ende schaffen damit die Bürger selbst das Wissen für mehr Nachhaltigkeit und genau dafür steht dieses Projekt. Und genau dafür steht eben auch die Konferenz heute. Wir wollen die großen Fragen im Miteinander lösen. Und ich bin auch davon überzeugt, sie lassen sich nur im Miteinander lösen. Wir wollen, dass sie mitreden, dass sie mitdiskutieren und dass sie unseren gemeinsamen Wissensschatz erweitern. Sie können sich einbringen, das ist mein Appell an Sie. Arbeiten Sie in den Workshops mit, arbeiten Sie am Konferenzpapier mit. Lassen Sie uns wissen, was Ihnen auf den Nägeln brennt, arbeiten Sie mit uns zusammen für unser gemeinsames Ziel, für ein innovatives und für ein nachhaltiges Europa. Ministerin, für Ihre wirklich inspirierende Keynote ähm, an dieser Stelle. Sie haben es schon angesprochen, Sie dürfen gerne zu mir kommen. <lacht> Sie haben es ja schon angesprochen, unser aller Ziel ist ein innovatives, ein nachhaltiges Europa. Und dabei ist natürlich jeder Einzelne gefragt. Was muss heute passieren, also am heutigen Tag, damit Sie heute Abend sagen, dieser Tag war ein Erfolg? Für uns ist das Wichtigste, dass wir einen gemeinsamen Aufbruchsgeist haben. Und das heißt ja nicht umsonst, from ambition to action, dass man am Ende auch sich gemeinsam committet. Was sind denn die ersten Schritte, die wir jetzt gemeinsam gehen müssen? Und wir brauchen eine gemeinsame Aufbruchsstimmung. Und diese gemeinsame Aufbruchsstimmung uns zu organisieren, das ist der wesentliche Punkt, der dann hilft, dass jeder Einzelne sich überlegt, was kann mein Beitrag dazu sein. Das ist ungefähr so wie in der Corona-Krise. Da kann jeder seinen Beitrag leisten. Und das gilt natürlich für die großen Fragen, wie die Klimaziele auch. Ganz genau. Ja, das Motto unserer heutigen Veranstaltung, Sie haben es schon angesprochen, ist From Ambition to Action. Was bedeutet das genau für Sie? Also was ist außer Ambition denn noch notwendig, um in Action zu kommen? aber auch zu bleiben, das heißt also beim Thema Nachhaltigkeit nachhaltig, auf Dauer erfolgreich zu sein. Also das eine ist ja, wir haben uns jetzt große Ziele vorgenommen und jetzt müssen wir das runterbrechen, welche Ebene muss welche Fragen denn lösen. 
und viele auch regulative Fragen, wie zum Beispiel den CO2-Preis. Das ist etwas, wir starten jetzt in Deutschland, aber am Ende muss das für alle Bereiche in Europa gelten. Das ist auch eine Frage von eines wettbewerbsfähigen Umfeldes, was dann äh, was so ein Level-Playing-Field am Ende auch braucht. Aber viele Fragen, und wir haben ja überall auch immer Kommunalwahlkampf, ich sage das immer im Kommunalwahlkampf, die schwierigsten Fragen sind im Moment vor Ort zu beantworten, weil die müssen es im Detail umsetzen. Die müssen Fragen nach veränderter Mobilität, veränderter Energieversorgung, die müssen all diese Dinge hinterher in die Praxis umsetzen. Und deswegen brauchen wir einen engen Schulterschluss von, ich sag mal, der operativsten Ebene bis hin zu den strategischen Ebenen. Am Ende wird es nur klappen, wenn wir uns in die Augen schauen, uns vertrauen und sagen, so wer muss was tun und wie können wir es dann zusammen hinkriegen? Ich denke, das Problem unserer Zeit ist sicherlich auch kein Mangel an, an Forschung oder an innovativen Ideen oder kreativen Ansätzen. Wo sehen Sie die größten Herausforderungen, gerade eben auch, wenn es um das Thema Skalierung geht, um den, den Einsatz bei nachhaltigen Innovationen? Ähm, wie, wie können wir dieses Thema am besten angehen? Das eine ist, dass wir Sichtbarkeit schaffen müssen für Dinge, die heute schon gut funktionieren. Also es gibt ja auch schon Pilotprojekte, wo man sehen kann, was wir heute schon können. Aber es sind auch noch ganz, ganz viele Forschungsfragen offen. Wir beschäftigen uns ja mit der Strategie des grünen Wasserstoffs. Wie können wir das in alle Bereiche hineinkriegen? Wie können wir die Stahlhersteller unterstützen, dass die Industrie in Deutschland bleibt? Wie können wir aber auch systemisch dann die Netze ertüchtigen? Wie können wir die Produktions-, äh, die, die, die Maschinen, also die Maschinen und die, die Infrastruktur, die wir dafür brauchen, um sowas zu produzieren, hier in Deutschland so innovativ auf den Weg bringen, dass wir sie dann am Ende auch exportieren können? Und in aller Herren Länder, wo vielleicht die Rahmenbedingungen durch Wind und Sonne viel günstiger sind als bei uns, wie wir das umsetzen können. Und da helfen eben Pilotprojekte und das ist genau das, Demonstrationsprojekte, die wir auf den Weg bringen, aus unserem Haus heraus, sowohl im städtischen Raum als auch eben im ländlichen Raum. Wir versuchen diese Strukturpolitik ganz intensiv durch Demonstrationsprojekte zu unterstützen. Das heißt also, Innovation muss ein absoluter auch Bestandteil unseres täglichen Lebens werden. Ganz klar spielt da natürlich Bildung und Sie haben ja auch schon solche äh, oder auch, auch Citizen Science Projekte angesprochen. Ähm, Sie haben zwei erfolgreiche Initiativen ja gerade schon erwähnt. Eins davon waren die Plastic Pirates. Ähm, das heißt, junge Menschen wirklich spielerisch an, an die großen Herausforderungen unserer Zeit heranzuführen. Ich habe selber eine kleine Tochter und bin auch immer bemüht, so kommt, muss nicht immer alles in Plastik verpackt sein. Ja? Ähm, ein wichtiger und vor allem äh, ein ganz großer Teil geht ja auch darum, äh, dass die jede einzelne Person die Chance bekommt, Teil der Lösung zu werden auch. Und wie können wir aber verhindern, dass solche wirklich großartigen Ansätze, solche Citizen Science Projekte nicht irgendwo im Sande verlaufen, sondern wir wollen ja, dass sie sich ausbreiten und, und dass sie noch mehr in Bewegung setzen. Richtig, man muss diese Ansätze, die da sind und ich glaube, wir haben überhaupt keinen Mangel an Kreativität. Ich glaube, gerade die junge Generation heute ist doch in diesem Bewusstsein auch aufgewachsen, wie wichtig das ist und trägt durch ganz unterschiedliche Initiativen dazu bei. Und gerade an Schulen und Hochschulen gibt es da ganz viele tolle Ideen und diese Ideen aber am Ende zu systematisieren, das ist auch ein Beitrag, den wir leisten können. Und Bildung für nachhaltige Entwicklung ist ja bei uns im Grunde etwas, was wir auch schon seit langer Zeit bei uns im Haus unterstützen damit eben die jungen Leute solche Gelegenheiten haben, es dann am Ende auch strukturiert weiter zu vermitteln und dadurch auch Kraft zu entwickeln. Das eine ist ja, wenn ich persönlich eine Idee habe, Kraft entwickelt, dass wenn ich andere begeistern kann, die mitmachen und vielleicht auch mal nachmachen. Man muss gar nicht alles selbst erfinden. Das stimmt. Das heißt also über dieses Citizen Science Projekt hinaus, wie können wir dann die Potenziale von Bildung oder auch das Zusammenspiel von Bildung und Forschung nutzen, um eine nachhaltige Entwicklung zu erreichen? Also wo könnten vielleicht Bildung und Forschung noch etwas besser zusammengreifen? Indem wir zum Mitmachen animieren. Selbst Forschungsprojekte leben davon, dass sie jetzt bis in die Mitte der Gesellschaft hineingehen. Wir reden immer über Datenschätze. Der größte Datenschatz sind die Menschen, die mitmachen, die sich beteiligen. Und das ist doch die Faszination. Wir können heute mit Forschungsprojekten in die Mitte der Gesellschaft hineingehen. Wenn ich jemanden zum Mitmachen begeistere, dann informiert er sich auch darüber, wo er mitmacht. Und das ist schon die halbe Miete. Und am Ende kann ich genau diesen Datenschatz, den ich aus der Mitte der Gesellschaft hole, dann richtig gut aufarbeiten und dann kann ich Erkenntnisse daraus ziehen. Und jeder, der mitgemacht hat, wird bereit sein, diese Erkenntnisse dann auch für sein Alltagsleben umzusetzen. 
Das stimmt. Ja, dann wollen wir doch einfach mal über das Thema Mitmachen sprechen. <lacht> Denn wenn es um das Zusammenspiel von Forschung und Bildung geht, können wir natürlich ganz besonders viel von jungen Menschen lernen. Und wir haben ein ganz tolles Beispiel dafür für Sie heute hier auch live on stage. Und zwar eine Studenteninitiative. Sie nennt sich Netzwerk N. Und well, as we all know, good networks are half the battle. Und deswegen, please welcome on stage, Leoli Schröpfer. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and a warm welcome also from my side. My name is Leonie Schröpfer. I'm currently a master's student at Flensburg University. And today I'm happy to be here as a speaker of Netzwerk N. In the following minutes, I'm going to introduce our network. So what is Netzwerk N? In a nutshell, we are a student sustainability initiative that is active on a German level and we have a focus on education. In the last eight years, we are educating, coaching and linking student sustainability projects all over Germany, aiming at establishing sustainable development at higher education institutions. But how are we doing that and why are we actually doing that? So we see the challenge that universities today in our knowledge-based society have a great responsibility to take, but they systematically fail in actually integrating sustainable development in all areas. So student groups form because they envision actually a sustainable future and they want to promote sustainable development. But then again, these groups often lack scope, resonance, networks, and also further education, and especially recognition from their respective institutions. So our vision is that these students and these students' groups are empowered and self-confidently act to implement their goals and to reach their aim of really establishing sustainable structures at their universities. And if we really manage that and have empowered students and empowered students' groups, we think that higher education system and the higher education institutions can be sustainable at all areas, namely in teaching, in education, in research, in transfer, and also in services. So the question is, what does Netzwerk N do to reach this great vision? Um, at the end, we actually do that with what Mrs. Kalczyk said, we come from ambition to action because we empower the students. And during the last years, we developed a number of different formats in order to reach that empowerment. So we um, work with the formats of student participation, of coaching, of education, and also of networking. And I shortly want to highlight our kind of most popular format, which is called Wanda Coaching. So there, student experts travel all over Germany to coach student initiatives and help, step, um, help reaching their goals. Last but not least, um, I want to highlight some of our accomplishments. So in the last years, we were in contact with more than 1,500 students who are active, changing more than 125 universities all over Germany. But our action does not stop at the German border. We are also connected beyond. So we are active in the student network called SOS International, Students Organizing for Sustainability. And there we are collaborating and acting together with um, student, net student sustainability networks from, for example, France, England, the Netherlands, or also Austria. And um, yeah, for example, on this picture, you can also see how now several years in a row we won the ESD, the UNESCO ESD prize. And all in all, I can say that we are kind of uh, a network that is a flagship project for students organizing for sustainability in Germany. And I know we have high ambitions, but I think or we see that our action um, is successful and that we see that it works. And I can just encourage all of us to work on eye level with students and with students' ideas and students' projects, that then all together we can empower universities to become sustainable and to become um, really future-oriented institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonie. Please join us here on stage, yes, before we set the stage for another outstanding project, which is part, actually, of your initiative, Netzwerk N, the Solar Campus in Karlsruhe. 
Karlsruhe is uh, actually considered one of the sunniest cities in Germany, but I think that's certainly not the only reason why this project is casting its shadow for a hat. Please welcome on stage Luca Springer. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm very glad to be here today. Kine was coached by Netzwerk N three years ago, and we profited from their knowledge and motivation because it helped us to improve our work. So what do we do at Kine? We want to inform others and ourselves about sustainability. Also, we want to contribute to a sustainable future with our mutual knowledge and projects. One of them is the development of a small-scale wind turbine. This is one of the rotor blades. It's 3D printed. And the turbine can even be used on a balcony. So another project is Solar Campus. Before Kine was founded, another scholar group initiated the installation of solar panels on the roof of our canteen. But there are multiple other roofs which are suitable for that. So we thought about the energy consumption of our university, which is very high at day. And all these roofs, with a total surface area of around 6,000 square meters, are all under the same administrative authority. Because of all that reasons, we decided to start a project that encourages the installation of solar panels on the campus roofs. We conducted an economic calculation to determine, to, to determine the financial aspects of the project. It turned out that it will be profitable for the university to use photovoltaics. After that, we performed a CO2 analysis. The estimated annual savings of 250 tons are equivalent to the amount of CO2 emitted by driving a car around the world 40 times. We presented these numbers to the stakeholders, and as a result, 24 roofs on our campus will be equipped with solar panels. Today, we are pushing the project, the realization of the project, and attend several events to promote it. We encourage all scholar groups across Europe to do the same, because this is very important. And we are happy if you contact us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Luca. Please join us. Ja, Frau Ministerin, wenn man das Strahlen in den Augen dieser jungen Leute sieht, die vielen Preise, lauter schöne grüne Preise haben wir da gesehen, ja. Und wenn man auch vor allem erfährt, wie sie ihre Ambitionen schon direkt in die Tat umsetzen, das muss einen doch schon optimistisch stimmen, oder? Also die Faszination, mit denen unsere junge Generation herangeht, ist ja schon mal ein springender Punkt, der das Ganze überhaupt, ich sag mal, ins Leben ruft. Wenn sie keine Freude daran hätten, solche Projekte umzusetzen, dann würde es schon nicht funktionieren. Aber das Zweite, was ja dieses Netzwerk N-Projekt auch so erfolgreich macht, ist ja, dass sie es geschafft haben, mittlerweile durch dieses ganze Coaching, was sie auch machen, eben über die eigenen, über das eigene Netzwerk hinaus zu agieren. Und mittlerweile sind sie schon so weit, dass sie ein Drittel aller Hochschulen erreicht haben. Das finde ich, ist ja schon ein Riesensprung, weil damit, also dieses Wissen weiterzugeben und dadurch ein Netzwerk zu knüpfen, das ist, glaube ich, das, was vielleicht auch ein bisschen den Unterschied macht zu früher. Mhm. Wir kriegen in dieser, in dieser in dieser Zeit nur Kraft an alles, wenn wir gute Netzwerke bilden. Und da hilft uns natürlich die Digitalisierung an dieser Stelle. Und ich bin total froh, dass die jungen Leute heute so motiviert sind und so einen Spaß daran haben, an diesen Entwicklungen mitzuwirken. Es ist übrigens immer die junge Generation, die treibt. Und es ist auch richtig, dass sie uns treiben. Ähm, wieso sind denn eigentlich studentische Projekte bei der Transformation zu mehr Nachhaltigkeit so wichtig? Was, was treibt Sie zum Beispiel an, Leonie? <lacht> ja, also mich treibt im spezifischen Kontext eigentlich zweierlei an. Also zum einen ähm, zu sehen, dass an Universitäten ist die größte Statusgruppe sind die Studierenden und wie wichtig es ist, dass eben diese Studierenden auch eine Stimme haben und beteiligt werden in zum Beispiel Entscheidungsprozessen. Und zum anderen treibt mich an, ähm, zu sehen, eben, was Sie auch gerade schon gesagt haben, was für eine Energie und was für eine Kreativität und auch die, der Mut, abseits von etablierten Strukturen zu denken, eben in vor allem kollaborative Organisationen von Studierenden eben steckt. Und ähm, das habe ich an eigener, mit eigener Erfahrung irgendwie ja, auch gesehen, zum Beispiel ähm, 
die, ja, ein gutes Projekt ist von Luca Kine in, in Karlsruhe, aber auch in Freiburg habe ich zum Beispiel das studentische Nachhaltigkeitsbüro dort mehrmals gecoacht und über mehrere Jahre begleitet. Und sie haben es jetzt mit wirklich viel, ja, mit viel Ausdauer und viel Mut auch in die Strukturen zu wirken, geschafft, dass ähm, dort ab diesem Semester es für alle Studierenden aller Fachrichtungen möglich ist, Nachhaltigkeit systematisch in ihr Studium zu integrieren. Und dafür braucht es eben ja, gewisse Freiräume, die, die die Studierenden bekommen, um aktiv zu werden, jenseits der strikten Curricula, als auch eben wirklich zu, beteiligt zu werden in Entscheidungsgremien. Darf ich fragen, was für Sie der Auslöser war, wo Sie gesagt haben, und da mache ich jetzt mit? Das war tatsächlich in meinem ersten Semester war ich aktiv bei der Studieneninitiative Weitblick. Mhm. Und da war es wirklich ähm, ja, eine Gruppe an junger, engagierter Menschen, die mich begeistert hat und die zunächst einmal kleine Projekte umgesetzt hat, ähm, wo ich einen guten Zugang gefunden habe, mich zu engagieren, um dann eben auch ein Wandercoaching selber zu bekommen vom Netzwerk N und dann ins Netzwerk N einzusteigen. Also auch Netzwerk. Ja, <lacht> genau. Ja, ähm, ich möchte die Frage vielleicht auch ganz kurz nochmal an Luca weitergeben. Was ist denn Ihre Motivation? <lacht> ja, sehr gerne. Dankeschön. Ähm, wir als Hochschulgruppe sind sehr froh, dass wir quasi ähm, die Studenten vertreten können in dem Sinne, weil wir ähm, einen Beitrag leisten wollen. Wir sind Studenten aus verschiedensten Fachrichtungen und wir tun uns zusammen und suchen verschiedene Projekte auf unserem Campus. Ähm, das Einzige bei uns ist immer das Zeitmanagement das mit dem Studium sehr eng ist und deswegen haben manche Projekte auch keine Zeit. Mhm. Und ähm, da sehen wir einfach die Chance, wenn unsere Hochschule dann, wenn, beziehungsweise wenn die Universitäten dann auch mehr Wertschätzung beziehungsweise mehr Anerkennung für die Leistungen haben, die wir als Studis da erbringen, dass das eben ähm, sehr förderlich wäre und auch sicherlich mehr Studenten dazu ähm, quasi, dass es denen ermöglichen würde auch, an solchen Studentengruppen teilzunehmen. Ja. Ich glaube, ein wichtiger Punkt ist, dass sie die Anerkennung kriegen und dass sich das vielleicht irgendwo sogar, dass sie das im Lebenslauf auch noch ein Stück weit mit unterbringen. Das eine ist ja, dass man das innerhalb der Hochschule anders anerkennen muss. Aber das zweite ist auch, dass wir vielleicht das auch sichtbarer noch machen müssen über, über die Studierendenlaufbahn hinaus. Das wäre mir auch noch mal ein Anliegen, dass wir wirklich hingehen und sagen so, wir müssen das, was da informell passiert, wir müssen dem einen anderen Stellenwert beimessen, weil wir sind ja immer sehr formell unterwegs und dass man diesen informellen Teil, auch informelle Qualifikationen, die man sich ja dadurch erwirbt, noch mal anders in den Vordergrund stellt. Ich glaube, das kann helfen an der Stelle. Absolut, ja. Sie haben gerade schon angesprochen, die Anerkennung, das Zeitmanagement auf der einen Seite. Also ich habe ich hab damals in Straßburg studiert und damals war gerade mal die E-Mail erfunden. Ja? <lacht> Wie kann man denn heutzutage den Austausch auch vielleicht von den Studierenden verbessern, um eben solche Transformationen auch noch mehr zu ermöglichen? Was, was sind da vielleicht einfach mal wirklich an die junge Generation weitergeben? Eure Wünsche? <lacht> Ja, also ähm, zum einen, also wir haben äh, die sogenannte Plattform N auch wieder zum Digitalen zu switchen. Mhm. Ähm, das ist ein Online-Kollaborationstool, das eben auch Nachhaltigkeitsstandards entspricht, ähm, wo wir schaffen, ähm, Studien studentischen Initiativen und auch allen weiteren Statusgruppen an Universitäten ähm, ja, sich zu vernetzen. Und da ist natürlich... Naja, es kostet unglaublich viel Geld, ne? so eine digitale Infrastruktur irgendwie zu erhalten und wir sind immer wieder dabei, Gelder zu akquirieren und da ist natürlich immer toll, wenn das irgendwie unterstützt wird, diese digitale Infrastruktur aufrechtzuerhalten und dass die auch stetig verbessert wird und neue Tools irgendwie integriert werden können, die ja eine App-Nutzung auf dem Smartphone und so weiter zum Beispiel ähm, nutzbar machen, genau. Und ein zweiten Schritt ist natürlich, wie Sie gesagt haben, diese Anerkennungsstrukturen. Ne? Also da kann man zum einen denken in, ja, wie kann ich ein Zertifikat erhalten, zum Beispiel, das ähm, mir erlaubt, ähm, zu zeigen, dass ich mich engagiert habe für Nachhaltigkeit, aber auch vielleicht Nachhaltigkeitsstrukturen in meinem Studium hatte, aber auch ähm, ja, über ECTS-Punkte, also über das Credit-System ähm, oder zum Beispiel auch über einen Erasmus-Austausch, der zum Beispiel im Fokus Nachhaltigkeit hat, was weiß ich, also irgendwie, dass man in die Richtungen auch offen denkt. Ja, ich glaube, es ist wichtig, die Kombination zwischen einer guten Unterstützungsstruktur und innerhalb der Struktur Freiraum für neue Ideen zu schaffen. Absolut. Und wenn wir da ein gutes, eine, eine gute Kombi finden zwischen dem, was wir leisten können, wir können in Infrastruktur ein Stück und auch Geld zur Verfügung stellen, aber ihnen dann auch unter dem Stichwort möglich machen, dann diese kreativen Ideen, diesen Freiraum auch lassen, den sie dann brauchen. Und wenn wir das schaffen, da gut zusammenzuarbeiten, dann kommen wir auch voran. Das hoffe ich, ja, absolut. 
Luca, vielleicht noch eine Frage. Ich meine, jede Krise birgt ja auch immer irgendwo Chancen in sich. Ich glaube, gerade jetzt im Falle der Corona-Krise haben wir gesehen, welche digitalen Möglichkeiten doch dann vorhanden sind. Ähm, was, was können wir denn in Ihren Augen aus der Corona-Krise beispielsweise auch in puncto äh, Innovation und Nachhaltigkeit lernen? Ja, auf jeden Fall, dass Digitalisierung auch eine sehr große Rolle spielen wird in Zukunft und gleichzeitig aber auch bedenken muss, wie viel CO2-Ausstoß die digitale Infrastruktur tatsächlich auch äh, verursacht und uns dessen auch bewusst sein. Zur Vernetzung ist es natürlich sehr praktisch, über auch Ländergrenzen hinweg die Digitalisierung zu nutzen und auch konsequent umzusetzen. Aus unserer Perspektive ist es jetzt so, dass wir zum Beispiel ein Forum geplant haben, das deutschlandweit ist. Ähm, es wäre natürlich auch denkbar, dass man das dann auch gerade in Karlsruhe in Verbindung mit Frankreich macht, die Projekte quasi auch das quasi die Nachbarländer mit einbezieht. Ähm, genau, und es ist einfach eine sehr tolle Möglichkeit, die aber auch eben ihre Umstände mit sich bringt, sage ich jetzt mal. Zum Beispiel, wir haben es ja auch gesehen mit den Telefonaten, die manchmal nicht so gut klappen, aber es ist immer noch besser, als eben keine Telefonate zu haben. Ähm, wir persönlich haben auch während der Corona-Krise auf digitale Medien ausweich ausweichen müssen. Und ähm, bei uns ist dadurch aber auch ein Teil der Interaktion so ein bisschen untergegangen. Und ähm, das kann man irgendwie doch aufrechterhalten, aber es ist auf jeden Fall eine sehr große Chance, Sachen am Laufen zu halten. Dankeschön. Frau Ministerin, ähm, was möchten Sie den beiden Vorreitern hier sozusagen und natürlich auch unseren Konferenzteilnehmern zu Hause in ihren Homeoffices äh, oder wo auch immer noch mit auf den Weg geben? Also erstmal möchte ich mal Danke sagen, weil das kommt, glaube ich, auch manchmal zu kurz bei diesen vielen Initiativen, die Sie neben Ihrem normalen Studium dann ja absolvieren. Das ist ein hohes Engagement und wir wissen das zu schätzen, auch wenn wir das nicht jeden Tag so sagen können, wie ich das hier heute vielleicht kann. Also insofern erstmal ganz herzlichen Dank für das Engagement, was Sie in Ihrem Netzwerk an den Tag legen. Das Zweite ist, dass wir dieses Netzwerk wirklich aktiv halten müssen. Und das ist mir echt ein Anliegen, weil wir sind immer in Projekten unterwegs. Und auch nach dem Projekt ist es wichtig, mit diesem Projekt weiterzulaufen und dieses Projekt am Leben zu halten. Und da können wir auch noch mal überlegen, wie können wir gerade im Netz auch diese Sichtbarkeit von Projekten, dass jemand anders sich abgucken kann und eben nicht alles neu erfinden muss. Wir sind ja jetzt gerade in Europa unterwegs. Und auch für Europa gilt, dass wir nicht jede Forschung überall machen müssen. Ich, wir haben gerade eben die Mosaik-Expedition gesehen. Da sind 20 Nationen dran beteiligt, die zusammenarbeiten an einem gemeinsamen Ziel. Und am Ende haben wir alle zusammen ein gemeinsames Ziel. Und wir müssen diese viele Kompetenz und diese vielen Projekte, die wir haben. Und jeder kann etwas dazu beitragen. Und das möchte ich Ihnen ans Herz legen. Seien Sie gute Botschafter, das immer weiterzutragen, auch wenn Ihr Studium irgendwann zu Ende ist und Sie dann in Familie und Arbeit und, und, und. Ich kann es mir vorstellen, aber das würde mich freuen, wenn Sie das am Leben halten, weil davon lebt im Grunde dieser ganze Wandel. Wir stecken mitten in einer Transformation. Das ist nichts, was nur ein Paar leisten können. Das kann nur funktionieren, wenn wir uns jetzt alle miteinander auf den Weg machen. Und insofern sage ich danke und würde mich freuen, wenn Sie diese Initiativen echt am Leben halten. Ja, danke auch. <lacht> Vielen Dank an Sie alle. Thank you very much. Ja, yeah. Innovation not only relies on network, but also on teamwork. Um, so um, I would like to pull your attention now to your possibilities for interaction. Because in your video right now, you can see a tiny little video uh, window on the right side. There will be some questions popping up right now. We want you to answer these questions by answering your ideas, your views on these questions now on the right hand side of your streaming window, especially for those who will not have the chance to join our workshops in the afternoon. Um, you can also contribute like this to our final conference paper. And uh, before I let everybody have a coffee break <laughs> and give a little bit of chance for interaction also here in our studio, so to say, um, we would like to have your response. Um, you can see now a polling with a slider on your window. So to get you in the mood for the upcoming panel discussion after the short coffee break, we'll be back in about 15 minutes, um, we would like you to think about and um, give us your opinion on the following question. Do we need more innovation or do we need to scale up existing innovations? So the question should appear now in your interactive window on the right hand side of your screen. Um, you will find that scale and you can choose from one side to the other. Um, 
please make your choice, and we will be seeing each other again in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everybody. On stage, in the meantime, I have been joined by my only physically, <laughs> physical uh, active um, expert panelist. So let me introduce you to okay. the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, Professor Dr. Johann Rockström. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> but also hopefully via online conference, I may now introduce you to the member of the board of executive directors Hello. of BASF, Zauri Dubourg. We have a... Uh, Madame Dubourg, online already? Yes, can you see me and hear me? Thank we you can much. hear you, we cannot see you at the moment, but I can hear you and that is perfectly fine for me. <laughs> then uh, we will have the chair of the EU Mission Board on Adaption to Climate Change, including... Uh, Excuse me? Ah, yes, I can see you now. Perfect. Uh, this is Madame Dubourg. But we also have uh, the chair of the EU Mission Board on Adaption to Climate Change, including uh, social change, Connie Hedegaard. Uh, Mrs. Hedegaard, are you online? Yes. yes. I am. Good morning. Okay. And the Commissioner for Sustainable Development and Future Generations, Her Majesty's Government of Gibraltar, Professor Dr. Daniela Tilbury. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we can only see you in a little window down there, but uh, hopefully on the stream, stream everybody can see you. Um, to start off, um, let's uh, talk about the results of our polling. Uh, do we have the results of our polling already? Because uh, before the coffee break, we asked you, what do you think? Um, is it not enough innovation versus not enough scalability? And we have a clear tendency, I would say, in the direction of uh, scale up existing innovations, actually. 28.6% voted for four, so more in the direction of scale up existing innovations. And 30% even voted on five. So I think there's a clear tendency in this direction. So, um, Professor Oxlum, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think this is a, a very well-grounded uh, result, actually. Okay. I think it's, um, my assessment would be that it's a reflection of the urgency we're facing. Okay. We have so much scientific evidence that we've entered the decisive decade for humanity's future on Earth. We have 10 years to cut global emissions of greenhouse gases by half. We have 10 years to halt the loss of biodiversity and keep all the carbon sinks and the resilience in the entire Earth system intact. So of course, 10 years is a very short time if you think of number one here, completely new innovations. But we know that we have scalable innovations on decarbonizing energy systems, on transforming the global food system to sustainable agriculture that we can through circular economic business models that we know we can take from the shelf, basically get a momentum in basically all business and economic sectors in society. So I would argue that uh, the four and five here is, um, is, is a question of, of amplifying and accelerating implementation, which has a lot to do with policy, because it's about getting the right policy framework to unleash the acceleration. For example, like Germany is trying to do now, to broaden the price on carbon from only the emission trading scheme to also the transport sector, the construction sector. So I think that's a, a valid outcome. Uh, Madame Dubourg, what is your opinion on the result? Can you re see the result, actually? Otherwise, I would repeat it. Yes. I can see the bars, and uh, my take on this is um, when we look at what's happening in the European Union uh, and with the Green Deal, for the first time there is a clear vision to go towards sustainability in a bigger framework. And I think um, 50 to 100 new innovation markets will be generated just by this Green Deal. Now, my assessment is yes, there's a lot of um, innovation that is already going on in existing fields, but we will also see, maybe more than people think, new fields, completely new fields that we will have to generate where technology routes are not 100% there yet. So this will take some time. Um, I would assess the voting uh, reflects uh, quite nicely that a majority of innovation is already in fields that we know. But 
there's still, if you think about hydrogen uh, technologies and then a lot of the time, uh, where the end result, uh, what the final technologies will be, is not 100% there yet. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Hedegaard, what is your opinion on the result? Have you seen it? I see it, and uh, I must say that it confirms very clearly my um, impression from meeting with business people and uh, people in the innovation environment. We have the solutions. It's simply too much of a bad excuse when people shy away from taking the necessary decisions now to apply the solutions, to scale the solutions, to get the pricing mechanisms, as Mr. Rockstorm was referring to, in place so that we can scale up and speed up uh, faster. I must also say, and that is what this mission in Europe, uh, in EU is about. Think if we could cooperate more on spreading the best practices, on sharing data, on building on each other's experiences, good and, and, and not so good. We could really shortcut to speed and to scale faster because the solutions are already there, provided we were better bringing knowledge into play. Thank you. And uh, Professor Tilbury, what is your opinion on the result? Well, I've, I agree with what's been said so far. Uh, there is a recognition that we need to accelerate implementation. But I think perhaps uh, my point would be that we need to shift investment on thinking beyond the technology now to understand that we need to change our systems. Because what's happening is this new technology is fantastic and these new solutions for sustainability are terrific. But what happens is the minute we adopt them and try to mainstream them, they get rejected by the system. Mm -hmm. They get pushed away. And for us to be able to adopt them more widely across the European Commission, we need to be able to uh, accept that the innovations are changing the system and are not easily just adapted to fit in to existing practice. And the sooner we recognize that they are bringing change in the way we do things and how we do things, the quicker we'll be able to adopt these new uh, solutions and technology and the quicker we can shift to sustainability. Thank you. Um, you might have realized uh, we have been joined in the meantime by another panelist, uh, which I haven't introduced to you yet. But um, picking up the topic of upscaling green energy and the successful application of existing innovations, I think Ersted is not only a pioneer, but also an international role model for low carbon energy supply. Um, the leading global offshore wind developer is the world's most sustainable company, according to the Global 100 ranking announced by the Toronto-based research company Corporate Knights. So, um, and uh, as we should always aim to learn from the best, we would like you, our audience now, to submit questions addressing our panelists um, and also our keynote speakers. Simply enter your questions on the right-hand side of your streaming window. You can also vote up questions, by the way, um, by other participants. If you want to know the same, you can just vote up this question instead of repeating it and bring us up, uh, bring that question up on top of the list. But uh, now, please welcome, so to say, our next panelist, Ørsted Senior Vice President and Head of the Region Continental Europe, Rasmus Erbo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rasmus, uh, and I come from uh, from Ørsted. Um, I have been uh, granted, if you move on to the next slide, um, five minutes or so uh, to tell you uh, the story uh, about us, um, which, uh, which I will do my best to do. Um, I don't know, uh, on my screen it is still uh, the original uh, first slide. Are you able to see the second slide? There we go, excellent. So uh, as was mentioned, um, Ørsted was earlier this year uh, announced to being the most sustainable company in the world by a Canadian think tank called Corporate Knights, which was basically based on a study of 7,300 companies uh, worldwide across all industries with a uh, revenue above uh, $1 billion. Um, but we were certainly not uh, born that way. Uh, so therefore, uh, a, a story around Ørsted is also a, a story around a profound transformation of a company. Um, 13 years ago, we were a, a Danish utility uh, with more than 90% of, uh, 
of our uh, earnings coming from fossil fuels. We were emitting roughly a third of the entire CO2 emissions of Denmark, our home country. Um, but uh, as you can see from this slide, going from, uh, from left to right, um, we uh, have, uh, during the last 13 years, reduced our CO2 emissions from our uh, generation capacity by 85%. We are on track uh, to fully phase out coal by 23, uh, and we have a target that we will meet uh, by, to be fully carbon neutral by 25. In the same period of time, uh, we have doubled our earnings, uh, but more importantly, uh, in this context, we have shifted our earnings uh, from being more than 90% from uh, fossil fuels into being almost 100% from renewables. At the same time, uh, we have moved from being a company with almost 90% of our earnings coming out of Denmark into being more than 90% uh, of our earnings coming uh, uh, of, from countries outside of Denmark. So a complete transformation of also our geographical footprint. And all of that we have been doing uh, while uh, improving our uh, profitability. So if you move on uh, to the next slide, um, which is uh, an attempt to do a very simple illustration uh, of uh, the uh, complete transformation we have seen within offshore wind over the last uh, 30 years. Um, so these are pictures of turbines and the scaling is right uh, compared to one another. Uh, so all, uh, all out to the left of the slide, uh, you see uh, the first offshore wind turbine in the world set up by us the, in Denmark in 91. It was 35 meters tall, uh, and the entire CapEx budget of that wind farm of 11 turbines was 10 million euros. Um, 30 years later, um, we, uh, we have to the very far right uh, a turbine to be commissioned uh, by 2022, which is roughly the size uh, of the Eiffel Tower. And you can fit a London bus into the little circle uh, between the blades. Uh, also, the proportion to the Boeing uh, is, is accurate. Um, the point is not only about the size, the point is very much that behind this uh, complete uh, uh, or behind this picture is a complete transformation of an entire industry. This is not just about us at all. This is about a complete transformation of the supply chain, of the way we install. Um, it is larger sites, larger turbines. Uh, it is cost reductions across all components. It is uh, shorter installation cycles lower operations and maintenance costs for the 30-year lifetime of a wind farm, and it is a significantly more uh, competitive supply chain. And if you move on uh, to the next slide, um, you will see uh, the result uh, of that journey with respect to offshore wind uh, measured on liberalized cost of electricity uh, relative to other uh, generation forms. So here you see uh, that uh, in offshore wind, uh, the cost has come down by almost 70% over the last uh, seven years, um, bringing it uh, on par uh, uh, in terms of cost for society with onshore and solar. And this picture also clearly shows now that today, due to the industrialization that I just talked about, um, investing into renewables is also the only thing that economically speaking makes sense. And I think the main point uh, from my perspective here, also echoing what, what was said earlier by, by my fellow panelists as a result, uh, as a response to, to, the, to the poll that was made, is that this has only been possible uh, due to, I would say, three things. First of all, it has been a clear and ambitious target setting from uh, political levels. But the target setting has also been backed up by a transparent regulatory framework that has provided support mechanisms when needed. And it has also been backed up thirdly by a clear pipeline of projects to allow the industrialization. Without these three things, the significant uh, cost out that we have seen in offshore wind would not have taken place. If the politicians deliver, uh, the industry will follow. If we then take uh, the, the last slide, uh, then I think my five minutes are up. It's a little bit busy, I apologize for that. Um, but but uh, what, what, what it basically shows is that, uh, as I think most of you know, uh, according to the European Green Deal, um, 
in order to reach uh, uh, net zero by 2050, uh, a, a Europe needs at least 400 gigawatt of offshore wind, four to four, four to 450 gigawatts of offshore wind. And here, uh, the three things uh, I just mentioned are uh, indeed uh, needed, uh, and they are needed now. Um, we have uh, an entire installed base of offshore wind in Europe right now of around 25 gigawatts. We install, as an industry, three to four gigawatts a year. Um, if we are to get to 450 gigawatts by 2050, uh, that three to four gigawatts a year would have to get closer to 10 gigawatts by the end of this year, and then trending towards 20 gigawatts, sorry, by the end of this decade, and then trending towards 20 gigawatts uh, during the 2030s. In other words, 10 years from now or so, the industry will have to, to, to install in one year more or less the same capacity as we currently have throughout Europe, and that it has taken the industry uh, more than 30 years to get to. Therefore, we need a dramatic shift uh, in the way we think about uh, offshore wind. We need to think about cross-border transmission solutions. We need to have a different approach to maritime spatial planning. And then thirdly, uh, and also very importantly, we need to um, facilitate uh, the transformation of hydrogen, which is obviously um, the bridge between uh, the offshore wind capacity and the possibility to uh, decarbonize hard to abate sectors. Finally, um, and then uh, I will leave it at that. Um, on the final slide, uh, you have um, uh, my view, our view of uh, the answer to the questions uh, that was mentioned before, and basically repeating what has already been said, that we have the technologies needed to reach net zero. Now we need the political direction and we need the leadership to unlock the necessary upscaling of these uh, technologies. And uh, the scaling happens best uh, when competition is allowed to work effectively. Those were uh, the words uh, from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, mm. Mr. Abo. Um, so, Professor Rockstrom, um, Mr. Abo has demonstrated how one company has stepped onto the path of green transformation. Um, how urgent is this from, let's say, your scientific point of view, uh, that more companies follow this example? Mm. No, I think this is a, a very good example of um, a transformative redirection, which we must see in all societies and all sectors and all companies. Um, I'm, I draw the conclusion today that uh, we've made some significant progress over the years in corporate social responsibility, in our ESG agendas, sustainability is, is really increasingly uh, you know, a core part of businesses. But now is the time to do exactly what, what Rasmus showed here for Ørsted, which is to completely reboot business models, to put sustainability at the heart of the CEO level and the board level to guide all investments, to do what BlackRock now has pointed out, that they will you know, scan all their investments from a sustainability framework. And I think that is absolutely necessary. And let me just complement what, what Rasmus shared here. The last 15 years, wind and solar have been doubling every 5.5 years in the world. But it has started from a very low level, so that's why it looks as if it's just you know, from 1% to 2.8% of the global energy mix. But it's exponential. Yeah. So if you just continue as business as usual, as, as basically Rasmus is pointing out here, we would actually, by 2030, in 10 years' time, have 50% of world electricity from wind and solar, just by continuing the pace of doubling that we are doing today. But it requires, just as he pointed out, a complete, you know, rethink from transmission cables, infrastructure investments, the maritime policies. It's, it's, it cuts across all sectors in society. And then I just want to mention that his point about uh, that the hydrogen part, which was actually raised in, in the previous question, is also fundamental here because wind needs to be coupled with, with the power to X points. I mean, where can you store and have that as a, as a transmission energy carrier? Uh, I think is fundamental, not least for the mobility sector. So there are some very interesting innovation pathways required here. Okay, Mr. Sedegaard, from your political point of view, what, what should politics do to make such pioneers' decisions standard here? 
Well, I think that uh, Rasmus Albus and Ersted's example shows sort of the complexity of this and, and how the public and the private sector policymakers and industry will need to work together in, in a, a much more coherent way that we, we have been used to. So I think cooperation uh, between public and private sectors are, are really key. And then I think that well, money makes the world go around to get the price signal right. It's not a small thing, it's a key thing. I think to get it right for investors, EU has put up this taxonomy on uh, what is a green investment, what is a black fossil investment. Uh, it's extremely important that investors start to move in the right direction and de deliver the, the capital needed for this. Then I also think that, as we also heard from Rasmus, Target setting is a key to have the direction must be very, very, the direction must be very, very clear. Uh, so we will not avoid regulation. And I think one of the things coming up right now in Europe is the whole recovery package. How can we really spend that enormously big pool of money in, to, to, to help us achieve the green um, targets that we have set? I think there is a very, very big job to be done there by policymakers to make sure that we are building back better now, that we are not wasting this opportunity that the recovery money will actually be spent uh, to promote the, the, the green transition. And then just two small, not small things, but, but just very briefly, I think that reskilling of jobs is key. And I think the public sector and policymakers have a, a very uh, strong responsibility there. And then I also think that public procurement could play an essential role in pulling better products, cleaner products, more efficient products faster to the market and mm -hmm. through that help us speed up innovation in Europe. Yes, um, since we also have someone, so to say, from the industry here, uh, Madame Dubois, what do you see as chances and risks when it comes to the sustainable or to the, that green transformation we've been talking about, and how do you approach this topic at uh, BAS, uh, BAFS? Yeah, so first of all, uh, we are very committed uh, from our side to make a major move and uh, to support the transformation. So today we have around about 15 billion of our net sales that is already list linked to sustainable products, which we intend to significantly increase. So the two billion of innovation funding that we do in our company will be concentrated on sustainable solutions. So every single innovation that will come out of the pipeline has to have an impact on sustainability. But let me qualify um, what I said also before, the 50 to 100 innovation markets. What concerns us most is the transformation from a timing perspective. Let me give an example when we talk about the renewable energy grid needed that Rasmus talked about. For our industry alone, this means we have to step up and scale up 10 times the renewable energy grid of today. And this is where we need cooperation with governments and regulations in that direction that incentivizes such a grid. Because you have to imagine BSF has halved the CO2 already the last decade. And we are coming now to a point where we have to do electrification processes of many, many plants. We are talking here 360 plants worldwide. And this is an enormous dramatic change. So we are ready to do our part. And we are very much looking forward to cooperate how this transformation can be done. But just to give you a feel, one plant takes 10 years of a buildup. And it's also technology-wise from an R&D perspective challenging because we talked about hydrogen. We talked about, in our case, about methane pyrolysis, new R&D innovation to make this work where the R&D is also, as you know, not 100% guaranteed. So I think this brings me to the risk part. I think the most important um, thing that we need to do jointly to gain trust in this transformation is to talk about transition timing. How can we work together with political frameworks and do our part to make this transition in a timing perspective so, so clever that we can take also society along? We also need more civil society support for wind parks, yeah, it cannot be that on one side politics gives targets. We try to do this together with politicians that we do a transformation. And then, there, then we have social unrest because of wind parks, which we still see here and there. 
for example, in our country. So this is where we need more cooperation. And I'm totally supportive of what Mrs. Hedegaard said here. Last point, um, CO2 pricing, I think from our view, uh, we need a common framework. Uh, the broader, the better, because um, if it's too local, this will cause disruptions in the competitiveness level of various countries. So EU would be already great. Global would be even better, but challenging. We know that. Last point on the taxonomy that Mrs. Hedegaard mentioned. I think the future is really also in incentivizing the right behavior. Um, at the moment, we see in the investment field that only 20% of companies are seen as green. But if you look at the value chain, those that are at the beginning of the value chain have much higher CO2 value created through production. So we need a system. And I think um, the EU Commission is working on this through EGAP and green accounting to do a more inclusive system where we put you know, um, incentives to the entire industries um, how to get an improved CO2 footprint. This is probably the only way to really achieve the Paris Climate Protocol that all companies are fostered towards uh, improvement. And this is what we really would like to support because I know that the EU is working on this and this is great. Um, so from our side, um, lots of changes and we are committed to do our part. Mm. Thank you. Yes, you've, you've been talking about timing and uh, Professor Röckström, Let's talk about planetary boundaries because in the opening speech, Mr. Gass has addressed how finite our resources here are, but you actually calculated how finite they really are. So are, are the measures that are already being implemented uh, really a substantial contribution or they are just a drop in the ocean? Mm. Well, so far, unfortunately, the scientific assessment is that we are we're following uh, very dangerous pathways, not only on climate, but on, on several of the planetary boundaries. And I just want to perhaps first make, make the, the point that the, the analysis defining the nine planetary boundaries are the systems that regulates the stability of the planet. And these are well known to us today, scientifically, but also in the world of business and in society in general. I mean, we're talking about biodiversity, land, the hydrological cycle, stability in the oceans, the stratospheric ozone layer, keeping the chemical pollution levels like microplastics and nuclear waste at levels that do not push system out of control. But the key message in a, in a dialogue like the one we're having today, I think, is that we have unequivocal scientific evidence that we fail even on the Paris Climate Agreement if we allow ourselves to go too far on the other planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. So if we lose too much on biodiversity, if we lose too much on land, and if we degrade too much on nitrogen and phosphorus, it will hit us back with non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions that will push ourselves so far that we cannot stay well below two degrees Celsius warming. So fundamentally, the Paris Agreement is, is a transformation towards a safe operating space within boundaries. The sustainable development goals, likewise, we cannot eradicate poverty and hunger and have good economic development without coming back into within planetary boundaries. Why? Because we have more and more evidence to show that if we push the boundaries too far, we, we, we cross break points where systems like the Amazon rainforest, we published a paper just yesterday on this, showing that we're approaching a point where the Amazon rainforest can irreversibly start moving towards a savanna state. Mm -hmm. Then we would lose the world's richest ecological habitat, mm -hmm. we would lose a major carbon sink, and we would distort livelihoods for millions of people because of the water regulating system of the Amazon rainforest. It's a, it's a commons that we all depend on. So yes, you're right that we need to kind of integrate the planetary boundary thinking also in our, in our sustainable business pathway. And still here we have a lot of scientific challenges because this, this calls for social sciences and natural sciences working much more closely together to find ways of managing the commons for human well-being, but also for planetary stability. So, Mr. Sedegat, summing that up, what uh, Professor Rockton just said, everyone is in demand here. So, the innovation politics as well. So, what needs to be done to get like, more sustainable ideas, more sustainable products, business models, processes, and social innovations from the development state to like a broad application in our economy and also in the society? Well, I mentioned before 
The price signal is important. I mentioned public procurement. That is not a small signal. There's a huge potential there. Uh, I also mentioned regulation. We see it, for instance, in the, uh, with the auto manufacturers. It actually means something. It speed up their innovation. When smart regulation sort of set a target somewhere out in the future that they need to live up to. So there are many things that policymakers can, can do in these respects. I also think that I think we have one challenge, and that is referring to what Mr. Rockstrom just said. I think this interlinkages between our different challenges is extremely difficult to handle mm. for our political mm -hmm. system to sort of think both of biodiversity and of climate and of this and of that and to assess the real cost of the needed in investments. So I think there's something there in the modeling uh, that we use, for instance, in our finance ministries that need to be substantially uh, reformed. Uh, and, and then I would also very much agree that science universities have a, a really big task here we are really good at making the natural science case for climate change. We have been focusing very much on the economic side, but exactly as also Johan was just referring to the social sciences, mm -hmm. to understand how we can better change, mm -hmm. not sort of only through regulation, but how do we as people, as citizens, how to make us change our behavior, our habits, how do we best do that? I think that the social sciences have a huge role to play here and to make really intersectoral sort of um, uh, cross uh, fertil fertilization within the universities is extremely important. Many universities would say, yes, we want to do this, uh, but we need to think much more across different areas also within the uh, world of universities. Yeah, I would like to pass this point on to uh, Mrs. Stilbury because also our Minister Kalicek this morning said that uh, yeah, we cannot dictate it all top down. We, we need a more holistic change. It needs to be lived holistically. It's a, it's a social change that needs to happen. Um, the, that, that change needs to be shaped by the people, actually. So how can one support from the educational side, adult education as well, and training also in company. We've heard some impressive uh, examples from the student side, but what can we do in, in, in terms also of adult education and training? Um, yes, thank you for the question. I, I agree, it cannot be top down for this to be accepted across society. And I also agree that people are the key to change. We cannot have a green transition without involving people. This is quite critical. Experts help us innovate, they help us drive some changes, but the ultimate adoption requires people to engage, be receptive and be supportive. But the problem is that we look to education for all the answers. And I have to say that at the moment, education is no longer fit for purpose. Just like we have to change our economic systems, just like we have to take our change our public procurement, we also have to change our education systems. I see a lot of frustration, especially in our very young people who know about planetary boundaries, who understand the complexities and linkages of the sustainable development goals about how poverty and engagement and gender parity links to economic development. This is increasingly understood by our young people. They also recognize that climate change we, uh, has brought more uncertain futures for them. Mm -hmm. They want to act now. And this is where the issues arise because they become very frustrated. They have the knowledge, they have the degrees, they have the understanding. They have very little vocational training. They have very little capability to actually bring about the changes that they require in the, in the social systems and in practical terms or technical terms. So they end up shouting metaphorically. They start having marches. They start complaining. They start raising awareness. How can we bring young and old into the change process? Well, our schools, our colleges need to change. They need to embrace, reject textbooks and start embracing working more closely with businesses and governments and community groups in problem solving the realities of sustainability and teaching 
young and old, about the capabilities or the competences needed to bring about these changes. At the moment, they are frustrated. They know, they understand, but they're not able. And I think that this is a key challenge that we're all facing. Mm -hmm. Like our, our colleague uh, earlier mentioned about the importance of public procurement, I think that education systems can be a very powerful tool for change. If we invest through our education systems across Europe to bring about sustainability and mirroring them in our education uh, system in schools and universities, it's, it's a very good way of using our recovery money. It's a very good way of showcasing what is possible so that upscaling can happen, not just because our teachers, our educators, our businesses that are, are training and supporting change can visualize and see those changes, but because they are part of the transformation processes. The pathways for change require education to also change. So this education towards the change that needs to also be lived in each and every company, of mm. course. So this is why the next question I'd like to address to Mr. Abo. How did you manage to get everybody in your company on board, on board the change agenda? And how did you make your employees part of the transformation? Thank you very much. Uh, just before answering the question, I'll just take the, take the opportunity to just uh, uh, repeat the point made by Ms. Hedegaard in terms of the pricing uh, from an industry perspective. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is very important from an industry perspective that we still go towards some kind of price stabilization mechanism. Otherwise, you don't have the regulation that is basically backing up uh, the targets that are put out there in terms of uh, a, a two-way CFD. I just needed to make that point. Uh, and now I will answer the question. <laughs> and when I talk about Erste uh, and uh, think about uh, the journey that we have been on, uh, I basically uh, see it as uh, three, four bold strategic decisions and then execution, execution, and execution. We uh, yes, we uh, we acted uh, at an at an at an early time, uh, but we uh, we only acted when we could see the writing on the wall, and I think that was evident to everyone. Um, but I think we we managed uh, as a company, as a team, uh, to 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 act forcefully, doing the right things in the right order, starting by divesting our oil and gas, uh, our, our non-core assets, our power plants, our oil and gas business. Getting, uh, getting our funding in place, um, uh, and then we could uh, do the capital allocation towards offshore wind. So in other words, uh, for us, uh, it was uh, doing, uh, you can say, more walking uh, than talking at the, at the early stages. Um, and we, I think that was very motivating for our employees, that they could see that, 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 that we, didn't, we didn't change our name to us that until uh, we were, in fact, uh, where we are uh, today uh, in 17. Um, so, so we focused on getting stuff done in the right order through execution. And our employees, uh, and including myself, uh, found that uh, very, very motivating. Okay, thank you very much. So before we take a closer look at mindset and behavioral mm. change, um, I would like to have a look at some of the questions that have been uh, admitted by our audience. We won't manage to answer all questions, but um, just to remind you, during lunch break, uh, you will have, our audience will have the chance to also chat with our panelists. Um, but um, there are some questions I picked out. For instance, which approaches have, been pro have proven successful to get decision makers to stop subsidizing fossil fuels? Maybe you can just raise your hand if you think or if you would like to answer that question. If no one raises your ha his hand, you have to answer it. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to be honest, I think the reason why the panel is not raising, uh, that we're not raising our hand is that we're failing. <laughs> we have uh, 550 billion US dollars in direct subsidies to fossil fuels as we speak today. And if you take indirectly, it goes way beyond one trillion. This is a massive failure, and it goes in, in, in the global south and the global north. And of course, it's more understood in the global south that we end up in these, this situation in terms of keeping the kind of economies at least emerging. But, but in, the, in the global north, it's, it's totally unacceptable to have uh, direct subsidies within the European Union, even going to uh, um, diesel for agriculture, for example. So, so that is 
a challenge. We have to withdraw those urgently. And I think what, what Rasmus pointed out and Conny Hedegaard as well is the path forward. We need to uh, provide business leaders with, with very predictable, trustworthy policy mechanisms on, on a price redirection, which means that the unsustainable practices become more expensive and the sustainable practices be, become cheaper by penalizing, not, not subsidizing, the fossil fuel-based practices and unsustainable practices. And, and we know how to do this. Again, it's not an innovation pathway. It's really just, just a, a decision-making where we need to see leadership come forward. So I think it's, a, it, it's one of these areas where, where we have uh, uh, the solution at hand. The next question actually is leading a little bit to our second part of the panel discussion, but since it has a lot of votes for it, I'd uh, pose it anyways. Um, the point was made that steering human behavior is probably the most difficult challenge, especially given that there are lots of great innovations already. Um, but how? So here is where innovation science often runs out of ideas. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Like in yeah, let me, let me uh, uh, combine a little bit uh, question one and two here, because um, I think how to change human behavior, for example, in companies, in groups, it's very much linked to what is rewarded. And uh, it starts, as my pre-speaker said, having clear commitments uh, from a company of what you would like to achieve. So you have to give a very clear allowance room and role model it. But What we, for example, change, the whole remuneration in companies is linked now to achieving CO2 reductions, to achieving uh, sales with um, products that are giving true contributions to sustainability. So we just have launched um, a CO2 database that was inspired by ideas from employees. Um, it's uh, a database for every single product, and we encourage our employees to make a contribution here. So for example, while we speak, there is a climathon running in BASF where employees can post their ideas on innovation, how to make a major contribution. Now let me come to the part of how do we change the trajectory? Because the fortunate question is not for me so much about subsidiary. It's about how do we steer the system? And that goes to your behavior question. Today at capital markets, companies are rewarded for profit generation. Nature doesn't have a value yet at the capital market truly in terms of a balance sheet. And also, you know, the education that was mentioned by Mr. Tilbury, it's not a function, it's a cost function in the balance sheet. And I think we are coming to a point where we also need a systemic change in what is rewarded because this is what drives behavior a lot. And that's why I really appreciate that we also look into the impact assessment of different companies. What are they really generating? What are we generating in terms of true value, not only for profit optimization, but also what's our impact on the environment, but also on the people's side. And for this, we need a common language. So we are working on this since more than eight years. And um, you know, in our company, lots of people are motivated to make a shift here. I think um, I'm very positive because I see more and more companies moving towards this direction. So I, um, there is no difference between people in companies and people you know, in the public. Um, there's a lot of energy, I think, at this point in time. I think Mrs. Hedegaard has a remark. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's just, yes, I, as you can hear from what I've already said, I agree very much on, on the price signal, but I also see that it, may, it means a lot that the green solution, the green choice is easy, that it is visible, uh, that it is the default solution. Uh, I mean, if it's cheaper to take the plane to a short distance domestic uh, dis distance, then you take the plane instead of the train. I mean, there's some structural things there where you can make the green solution the default solution. I think we have seen it very much with meat consumption. It's not that it's prohibited to eat meat, but many of us have gotten the information, have understood, ah, red meat is worse than and not red meat, and that is worse than you know a chicken, and that is worse than fish, that is worse than vegetables. And when that sort of information started to trickle down out there, then the big supermarket chains in many European countries could see that something fundamentally was changing among the eating habits. Not that we all became vegetarians or vegans, but 
we just started to be more conscious of our choices. Well, that, that pretty much already answered the next question I have, but uh, I think Mrs. Tilbury also has a remark. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just quickly want to follow up on that. And, and I want to say that, um, um, you know, human beings are very complex. Um, we don't just follow a, a sequence of decisions and end up with the same outcome. We all consider um, what's happening in our lives and have different variables that influence how we behave, how we act and how we think. So, you know, sometimes the behavior language can be quite restrictive because it sort of assumes that there is a linear passage here that that is complex that is much more complex in reality i support what has been said by the other speakers because i think if we are going to support the adoption of actions and life changes that are more sustainable we need to provide more positive examples of change going back to the food example i think the shift away from meat to other options is happening because vegan food and vegetarianism is becoming more attractive Yes, more easily available, which was the point made earlier too. It's easier to go into a restaurant and see the vegetarian options. And structurally, we are adopting and making more viable and possible uh, to have these options available. But it's also a more positive shift. People are not moving away from meat because of the negative messages. It's because the alternatives are more interesting and available. It's the same with the climate action. The doomsday messages are not really motivating people to shift into um, taking action, which is more positive. We need to bring more creative futures and alternatives, make them more visible and interesting for people so that they can make those choices that are more sustainable. And our colleague earlier, Sari, was mentioning the innovation in her company. Again, that's based on a very positive, inspirational message and looking at ways that we can shift more positively rather than reminding people about doomsday scenarios. So when we talk about behavior shifts, I think it's important to recognize that complexity. Yeah, I think this pretty much leads already to the second half of our panel discussion. Um, therefore, we have a lot of questions actually left, which uh, we are running out of time a little bit to answer. So um, none of the questions will get lost, actually. So um, you have the chance during lunch break to also chat with our panelists roughly around from 12.15 to 12.45. And uh, please also write your answers on our Have Your Say page um, on the right side of the window where you have the questions you will be finding there. So they end up in our uh, paper at the end. But uh, now I would like to lead over, so to say, to the second part, because obviously it's a very strong topic also demanded by our audience. Um, so let's move on to the second part. Since it's been already a big topic in the questions as well, let's have a more detailed look on what each individual can do and where politics might be needed. Um, we also want your opinion, please, again, as our audience. Um, you remember the polling from uh, the first half of the panel discussion. You will now see another question popping up, and please make your choice there. Do we need more individual action, or do we need more political action? Uh, we will be looking at the results shortly, but before, in the run-up to this event, we uh, met with a woman in Brussels who truly combines ambition and action already. Ich denke, wir können alle etwas ändern in unserem persönlichen Umfeld, dadurch, dass wir achtsam sind, was wir einkaufen, wo wir einkaufen, aber auch noch Wichtiger fast, was wir nicht einkaufen, zum Beispiel das beste Wasser kommt aus dem Hahn und nicht aus der Plastikflasche, aber auch brauchen wir wirklich 60 verschiedene Anziehsachen im Jahr und vor allen Dingen können wir nicht aus den Resten, die wir selber machen, köstliches zaubern. Und ich sage euch, ja, wir können. Das hilft nicht nur dem Klima, sondern der Diversität und allen anderen. Wir müssen begreifen, dass wir Teil der Natur sind und natürlich essen sollten und im Einklang wieder mit der Natur kommen können. Ja, also ich wünsche euch viel, viel Freude und viele Erkenntnisse bei dieser Konferenz. Ich bin froh, dass sich so viele Menschen für dieses Thema, für dieses wichtige Thema interessieren. Ähm, eines habe ich gelernt. Wer mehr weiß, kann mehr machen. Insofern viel Freude und viel Spaß bei dieser Konferenz. Mhm. Ihre Sarah. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Fina, for these, those very refreshing and inspiring words, actually. So uh, let's have a look if the polling results are already available. And uh, of course, I want to share them with all of you. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. We have, uh, in case the others cannot see it, a strong shift to the right side so that more political action is actually needed. Um, first of all, your opinion on this, Mr. Rockström? Well, to, to begin with, and I think it kind of ties quite nicely with our previous discussion, it's, it's, and I think there's a lot of scientific support for this, it's not either or. Mm -hmm. It is uh, both on, on the left-hand side of this uh, graph on individual values, behavioral change, all the way to the big political change. But I'd just like to kind of tie it together to, um, to also some of the elements we had in the previous discussion that so we have 10 years to turn this around. We need to fundamentally transform all societies in the world at record pace, at a pace that can be defined as nothing else than, than an energy revolution, a food system revolution, it's kind of system revolutions. And if you look at any population in any society, it's a normal distribution. You have in one end the skeptics or denialists. Yeah. Let's leave them aside for the moment. Mm -hmm. And then in the other end, in, in societies like the German society or the Nordics, you, you seem to bump into a glass ceiling at roughly 20%, meaning that up until 20% you have the well-educated, the well-aware, the well-informed, those that are willing to pay a bit more for sustainability, that go to bio company and buy ecological food because they, they can take the little premium. But in between, you have 80% in any society that are like people are most normal. They are what I call indifferent. They focus primarily, they're not against, but they're not so much for. And I think our challenge now is how do we get the 80% on board? And that's where I think that Sauri and Kony has, has the key points. It has to become easy. It has to become more attractive. It has to become, you know, we have to surf along a journey where you choose the ecological tomato in the food store, not because it's ecological, but because it's cheaper, healthier, tastier, and more attractive. And we're starting to see that shift. And I think this is where I support the outcome here, that we need the political action to support this. Just give you one little example from the news this morning. A big challenge in Europe is that we're feeding our poultry with soya. Mm -hmm. So our eggs are fed by feed that destroys the rainforests. Okay, is any consumer aware of this? Answer, no, in general. But what happens if you would do, use local feed, which is all available in Europe, and produce eggs in that way. Well, the poultry industry refuses that because it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. They don't think the consumers will be willing to pay a little bit extra. But for the, for the first 15%, it would probably succeed. The environmentally aware would buy for that premium. But my goodness, we have to get everyone to buy the sustainable eggs. So of course you have to penalize the soya. Mm -hmm. You need the politicians. Put a price on the externality. Because the only reason why the soya-fed poultry is cheaper is that the planet is subsidizing. The planet is paying, and we, in the end, get the invoices. No, the young will get the invoices. Exactly. They will get the invoices, hitting back so hard. So I think there is a, let's put it this way, I would have voted in that way as well. <laughs> and I think, uh, Mrs. Sedegaard, you strongly agree. <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> No, but I think that's because it's being done centrally from, uh, yeah, so now it should be okay. Um, we will not make it to the ambitious targets. We will not fulfill them uh, un unless we get a lot of politics also. So we need politics. But now I have been in politics myself, and I know that politicians and governments, ministers, parties, they cannot in the longer run do these things and often these long-term things if the citizens are not yeah. also yeah there behind them. I mean, that's just how it is in, in democracies. So I think it is a, a both and. And I think I, I have a, 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 a telling example. I think in the, uh, the Danish, very, very big meat producer, Danish Crown, the CEO there uh, one year and a half ago suddenly set a target for carbon neutrality for the whole company for 2050. Mm -hmm. And he was asked, why do you do this now? Why didn't you do this five years ago? And his answer was because five years ago, 
the pressure was not there from our consumers. I mean, it means something. Every day when we buy something, when we consume something, we send a signal to those producing our goods and we send signals to the policymakers and decision makers whether this is important, whether we really want action or we just want to continue to talk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Tilbury, your opinion on the results? I think they're very expected. Um, I think we'd all like our politicians to, to do more. But as has been mentioned before, um, politicians are voted by people and they will, they will take forward uh, certain risks, but also ensuring that whatever decisions they, they adopt, they are supported by society. And I'm afraid that there isn't still enough people across society that are adopting or supporting wide measures in sustainability. So this goes back to our question about education, awareness raising and engagement. And I think the more people engage in the process of decision making, in the process of um, planning for sustainable development, the greater the take up and the more likely that politicians will then um, bring forward some of the sustainability targets that our colleagues were talking about earlier. There were three things that were measured, that were mentioned before. Uh, that are important for politicians to take forward so that we can upscale sustainability. One of them was setting targets. The other one was facilitating uh, legislative work or frameworks that enable the much wider adoption of, um, of sustainability. And the third one, for me, it's not financial incentives, but it's actually leading by example, which is the public procurement arm we keep talking about. If, we, if governments invest uh, in their education, in their economic, in their social systems, so that they reflect sustainability in the way they conduct their business, then they are already leading by example and they are showing the way to others in our community about how this wider adoption and this green transition can take place. So I think they're very interconnected. Talking about leading by example, um, I'd like to know, what do you personally do? How do you personally set an example? And uh, I would like to give that question back to uh, Madame Tilbury. <laughs> Mrs. Tilbury, please. Sure. So, so in my office, um, for example, we're currently involved in recognizing best practice and trying to inspire change across Gibraltar through identifying what we consider are very innovative mm -hmm. initiatives and showcasing them. In the process of doing that, everything that we purchase, everything that we do, and every process that we use to uh, achieve this supports sustainability. So everything from the banners that are standing behind me actually procured through sustainable process. We know where they're sourced from. We are avoiding plastics that are single use. We are um, adopting decision-making and investment through the process of promoting sustainability. So we are trying to walk the talk um, in, in engaging with sustainable development. Another project we've been working with is the development of new schools in Gibraltar. We have six new schools to build over the next decade. Well, three of those are built already, and they are supported by sustainability principles at their core, from energy generation to the training of teachers to understand sustainability principles in the curriculum, to the procurement process that supports the running and maintenance of schools. So again, um, we are trying to walk the talk and encourage others to therefore um, adopt this, this much broader measures. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit out of time, and uh, therefore, um, I would like to lead over to our next keynote speaker, um, because the interaction of research, science, and education has already been addressed by all of you, and also by our minister this morning. Um, I'm now looking forward with you to learn more about a concrete example of how we can develop joint solutions that are supported by the population and then implemented accordingly. So in other words, how can we achieve that technical innovations and social innovations go hand in hand? And uh, please also don't forget to submit your questions, especially on this last keynote. I would like to welcome now together with you the program lead Living Labs at the Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions, Dr. Leonard Verhoof.
Thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly fine. Good, <laughs> good. Well, good morning and thank you for your kind introduction. Um, we all agree that the world has real urgent challenges and they're all very complex. And in cities and metropoles, these problems show themselves every day. So could I have the next sheet, please? And here you see some of the effects of changing weather patterns in Amsterdam. The canals overflow. The challenges require innovations, but we experience that innovation is going too slow and too linear. Projects make insufficient impact. Why we need action is not an issue. We heard about that this morning. But how to do that? How? We believe in doing that with urban living labs. And I would like to share our experiences with you. My whole life, I've worked on innovations. Uh, some example is building a city with solar energy. Next slide, please. That was the Sun Cities project 10 years ago. And in all these endeavors, many more, the collaboration, true collaboration was key to success. And the minister already said this morning, it's about trust, new forms of trust and involving people in the innovation progress, process. I have great pleasure to work here in AMS Institute. Next sheet, please. AMS was founded by the Technical University Delft, Wagen University and MIT in 2014, and that was in response to a tender by the city of Amsterdam. Our mission is to help reinvent cities in challenges of urban mobility, energy, circularity, food, digitization and climate resilience, and on the connection of all these. Reinventing cities implies that we need to work in the existing urban fabric with all of its actors and complexities. Could I have the next slide, please? We believe that through talent, ideas and collaborations and closely interacting with cities, we can make incredible steps. And we do this through our innovative education system, a two years master's engineering degree where students really get out into the city to build living labs. We do this through our interdisciplinary research and innovation projects, such as the exciting autonomous canal boats, rowboat. And we do this through our partnerships and entrepreneurship program, startups and big companies. Our connection to the city of Amsterdam is essential it is here that we do our urban experiments to come to real solutions. And now we're active in over a hundred projects with scientists and city officials and companies. Next sheet, sheet, sheet please. Um, urban lab labs are at the heart of our institute. But what is a living lab? It is a laboratory. What do you do in a laboratory? Experiments, more than one. But now we do it in real life and tailored and connected to real complex and urgent challenges of the city, with multiple disciplines, inclusive for all, non-linear. We see successful examples around the world, in Amsterdam, Stockholm, other cities in Europe, but also across uh, the ocean in Vancouver and Montreal. To work in real life work means with working with many and quite different stakeholder groups, cities, citizens, companies and researchers. This is quite complex and every stakeholder looks at the world differently. Therefore, the process should be totally clear to participants. And key is that all participants respect and accept themselves in their needs, but also in their capacities. Also citizens bring in skills and expertise. That requires good methods and skilled professionals. We at AMS and in my program do that in an integrating manner. Next slide, oh, we have it already. And um, with four activities, first of all, we develop process tools. A good example is our Urban Living Lab canvas built based on the business model canvas to build a research lab in the city. With those tools, we built and operate labs to make impact. We are now involved in more than 10 labs, food, circularity, energy, and all the other themes we work on. And our master students in their second year, they built labs with the city over 20 now already. One example of our living lab where both the students and me work is at the Marine Train, right at our doorstep. The, the third uh, pillar is to share experience through training, for instance, with the summer schools. And last but not least, we want to help push forward the under understanding of urban innovation through research. Can we prove which method of experimentation works better than the other? Much work is still needed. 
but we are not alone. A community is forming around Living Apps. In the Urban Living Apps Summit in 2020, a yearly event we organized, experts identified actions which could benefit from European cooperation. Next slide, please. I mentioned two. One is to formalize and standardize the Living Lab process, tools and training, so we can compare different experiments through Europe. And the second one is to foster methodological urban innovation research. Much is still unclear how and why, and what is the deep understanding how change happens in a city with citizens. The potential benefits, benefits are big. This will help thousands of public professionals drive local transformations. We see it in Amsterdam. It will enable that an experiment done in Amsterdam can be replicated to Stockholm and vice versa. And companies can choose the most appropriate lab knowing that results are transferable. And last but not least, that is something which we work on hard and it's not easy. Cities are respected in their roles and they experience the innovations at their own and not something which is brought by them on them by the city or by uh, the researcher. This is a very short introduction to what we do here. I gave you my views on improving the impact of innovation in the system we work on. Because of time, I have to sum up. In Obviously, we lost the connection to Mr. Verhoof. Anyways, uh, he was about to sum up. <laughs> So, um, yeah, if you still can hear us, uh, thank you very much to your interesting approaches, especially on how we can foster behavioral change um, for a more sustainable lifestyle as well um, and integrate all the technical and social innovations. I think this is also a great impulse for the workshops taking place in the afternoon and for all of you joining there. But um, since he was roughly at the end, um, I would like to know your opinion on his words, first of all. Mm. No, I think this is a, a very interesting and, and, and promising example. It's important to recognize that over 50% of the world population today live in urban areas. We're projected to be an urban planet with 75% of the world population living in cities. When we look very carefully, we know that uh, 8, 9 million people in the world each year die prematurely because of air pollution in mm -hmm. cities, because of fossil fuel burning. And, and an unsustainable biomass burning. So we have, again, coupling back to our previous discussions, if you want to succeed with a transformation to a, a zero carbon sustainable future, you have to find these nuggets of advantage. You know, what is really attractive for citizens and for urban citizens to have clean air so you have strong lungs to deal with pandemics like COVID-19 mm -hmm. is a winner. It's obviously a winner. And that is a winner in Amsterdam, as it is in Berlin, as it is in New Delhi. So I think this is, this is an important path. We are currently working very closely with something called the Science-Based Target Network to take the planetary boundaries and set science-based targets for cities. So to basically to support exactly what, what um, uh, Dr. Lerhoff has, has been sharing here. And just to say also that Amsterdam is one of the most exciting cities in the world today. I mean, you've come furthest when it comes to sustainable mobility. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Connie, with uh, <laughs> Copenhagen is probably in the competition here right now. But also to say that you have Kate Roworth with you on the donut economics model for Amsterdam to, to really integrate both planetary boundaries, but also a just sharing across sectors within a safe space in Amsterdam. So I think uh, uh, his point about so many lessons to learn from these experiments to scale them and test them elsewhere is, is a very promising path. That could be something to take away from, from a dialogue like the one today. So, Mr. Foof, since you are back, I will give you the chance to briefly summarize, so to, so to say, um, your, your impulse keynote. <laughs> okay, I didn't know where we lost uh, me, but uh, I lost you also. Uh, so, if you can go to the last slide, please. Yeah, to summarize, um, I did not touch upon quite some issues. And uh, if I summarize, no, one previous, please. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's the last one. Um, but we have to reinvent our cities. And um, we have to do that by involving all stakeholders, use and develop robust tools, 
and work in real life. And my point is that the urban living lab methods is one of the methods which can really help solve challenges and improve the impact of innovations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, of course, I'd like to ask all our other panelists as well what they are thinking of uh, Mr. Verhoof's um, speech. So, um, I would like to switch to um, actually, uh, yeah, Mr. Sedegaard, what, what is your opinion on the Amsterdam model? <laughs> Well, what I know from, from the presentation here, I think that a lot of things are happening in Amsterdam and as we hear, particularly on, on the water side for, for very good reasons and there is a very strong history on this in the Netherlands. But my takeaway is, and that is also related to this EU mission on adaptation to climate change, where we try to find ways, how could we explore together the, the best practices? How could we learn from each other more. We are not very good at that in Europe. Each city goes from themselves, a region starts finding out why don't we do this and that, but they don't know that 200 kilometers from themselves, another region has already tried out this solution. So mm. could we not use digital means by shared data, by having some shared goals? Could we not find ways to be much better in Europe to shortcut to better solutions in more places. Uh, I think that is what we very much need to be better at within the next 10, 10 years. So that's for now. Mm. So yeah, you're talking about more um, exchange. Um, uh, I'd like to hand this question over to um, Zauri because exchanging ideas in the industry sector how, how willing is actually the industry? I'm not talking about science in general, not the knowledge that is gained in universities. I'm talking about the individual research in each and every company. How willing is the industry actually to share knowledge to help um, also foster sustainability? Yeah, so um, I, can, I can reassure you when I listen to the conversation in the industry, there's a dramatic shift because a lot of players, at least in our sector, the chemical industry is currently exploring a lot of new technologies. For example, in the area of recycling, uh, we are talking about this. How could we make a major contribution here? Mm -hmm. We are talking about how we deal with plastic waste, where there was an initiative that we grab uh, the key leading uh, rivers in the world that pollute the ocean with plastic. And we are currently experimenting, for example, in Nigeria, how to do the chemical recycling of the waste plastic and take it out of the river so that it doesn't even end up there. So my point um, is actually, I think the most important part is that we create a we. Yeah? And why do I say that? Uh, Mrs. Hedegaard rightfully said we need a co coalition among various stakeholders here to go jointly towards sustainability. I think uh, we as BSF are very much promoting this Green Deal because we feel it's a historic chance to make a transformational move. But what we see also is we need concrete roadmaps, how to get there. We need to get in a dialogue, what is our contribution? What do we need as a framework? And here the political question comes back. And um, I think what I would like to stress is we need to talk more about dilemmas before we had the conversation about uh, the agricultural industry, for example, soybean was one example. Just to give you a gut feel what is going on. In the last 10 years, we have more or less, uh, since 2050, tripled the number of people in the world. And we have lost 40% of acres to produce food and there are 3 billion more to come. So what we need is to talk honestly about dilemmas, how to, you know, make people um, you know, grow at one point in time, how to comply, because we lose acres at the moment because of climate change. So we do not have so much surface anymore. And this is a big challenge, why it's not so easy to just produce everything locally. If, if this would be possible, we would do this immediately just for Europe. But Europe, for example, has a very good climate still and is producing wheat for the whole world. So we are deciding literally how many more people we can nutrition in the emerging world. So these are dilemmas um, that the industry is certainly facing. Um, and we are very open to talk about this. In a nutshell, I would like to see more pro <laughs> sustainability and being pro wind parks than being against. Uh, and this is where I think 
society, politicians and industry have to really define the corridor of how we can get there. Since you mentioned the wind parks, I'd like to hand the question over <laughs> or ask for the opinion of Mr. Abo. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think uh, two two points for me uh, to highlight uh, related to to um, collaboration uh, uh, and sector coupling. First of all, uh, an example, a real life example from Copenhagen, uh, where just uh, together with five other Danish companies have put to forward a vision of creating a one gigawatt uh, hydrogen factory by 2030. That is an example where we uh, go beyond uh, offshore wind generation and uh, uh, the actual electrolysis of the hydrogen facility and basically uh, link uh, the solution directly to the off-taker. So you have a, a so part of the partnership, you have you know the maritime uh, business, you have the airline business, you have the transportation business as part of the total offering. So we need as an industry within renewables to start uh, reaching out and uh, coupling sectors uh, around specific business proposals. Um, I think another point also on the collaboration, if you take it even, even one step higher um, and zoom in on offshore wind, uh, you know, uh, CO2 emission doesn't really, it's not really about borders, doesn't really care about that. So, so, so if you take Germany as an example, which is, you know, the industrial champion in Europe with a very high population density and therefore also significant uh, energy demand. Serving Germany with 100% of renewables is indeed challenging if you only look at what is available within Germany. Mm -hmm. But if you lift um, the horizon to also include neighboring countries, then the solution becomes possible thanks to access to the North Sea and to the Baltic Sea, which offers plenty of, of, of potential for offshore wind and hydrogen production. But this requires that at governmental level, uh, you have a more uh, sort of, you go beyond your own borders and have a visionary European approach to uh, um, renewables penetration across Europe. I think those are two specific examples on uh, the need for increased collaboration from our perspective. Mm. So taking it from the north down to the south of Europe, so to say, uh, Mrs. Tilbury, what is your opinion on the topic? Uh, um, I would, I would just, I was just thinking here about the role of education and and uh, in all of this, and I was just thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had the opportunity to just start from the beginning? If our universities and colleges didn't exist as they do now, and we had to create them from scratch, imagine if they were living labs. Imagine if they, you know, they became those cities that our colleague was sharing with us. Imagine if the students and the teachers were living in that type of environment and learning every day about what a sustainable future looks like. And I think that that is our challenge. Our challenge is transition an outdated system, which is controlled by quality agendas, which are very much about standards of knowledge and standards of knowing, to shifting that to standards of ability and competence. And if we can create and help students and teachers imagine and develop those skills for transitioning us to a much better future, then all this technology will have a purpose. They will, it will have a foundation. It will have a capable group of people who can take it forward. And I think that that requires governments to cooperate to actually set those standards in the education systems. I think universities are very willing to transform. They have great partnerships with businesses already, and those could be extended. I think students are really not that keen on sitting in very large classrooms with 100, 200 and 300 students learning digitally when they could actually do that at home. If they're going to go to a campus, if they're going to go to a college to learn, let them experience sustainability and live it rather than be taught the theory and principles of it that they could do in their own time. So for me, I'd love to see that business partnership and that government support, those recovery monies and building back better, being invested 
in these areas where we could uh, develop education to transition us towards that much more brighter future. I hope this makes sense. It does. <laughs> um... Professor Roxham, I've seen you taking notes all the time. You're a little bit in advantage here because you're standing beside me. Um, I think you want to say something. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just want to, it, it's kind of, I, I put the, the note here, European Union leadership. The, the point that we're focusing so much of this conversation on, on, uh, on Europe, on behavioral change and a transition to a sustainable Europe. Well, we must recognize two things. One is that we are totally interconnected mm -hmm. with, with what happens elsewhere on the planet and it hits back on us. Just as, uh, as, as was pointed out um, earlier here by Rasmus, the, you know, our greenhouse gas emissions don't care about national borders. And I think that is one of our challenges now. How can we get our thinking exactly as, as Daniel has pointed out here, kind of framing our entry point in sustainability being the path towards city design and, 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 and business transitions to start becoming the norm also in other parts of the world because we have to admit that currently the European Union is the only region in the world showing climate leadership. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have the, the Chinese uh, announcement last week of, of having uh, an aim of net zero latest 2060, which is a remarkable mm -hmm. step forward. But otherwise, we are, we are really lagging behind on the transition. And just to give you one example here, how do we enable exactly what Rasmus shared with us in terms of now renewable energy systems being competitive with fossil fuel energy systems in Europe to be that also in Africa? Because that's not the case in Africa today because interest rates are so high that it's too expensive to invest in, in, in the same kind of windmills or, or kind of getting the, the momentum going in Nairobi or in Lagos. So I'd like to see us thinking also as European citizens, how can we truly um, share, just as Daniela pointed out, becoming more partners, also beyond our, our European borders. That, that's basically, I think, one concern we should bring with us as well. You, you previously mentioned the 20% of people that are constantly in denial. <laughs> um, we have a question for that, which I would like to um, ask also to uh, Mr. Verhoof. Um, one person wrote, I'm afraid there's a huge lack of scientific literacy in society. Current science neglecting reaction of so many people on COVID-19 made it so obvious, and it's similar reaction of many people ignoring warnings of climate change, making change of patterns in consumption and production necessary. Mm. So um, how can we build better understanding for scientific results and get science closer to people? I think living labs is a good approach, but um, maybe Mr. Verhoof, you have an opinion on that? Um, yes, thank you, uh, thank you. Um, there is a, uh, um, if we bring together the different stakeholder groups, uh, there's in the beginning a lot of misunderstanding so uh, a citizen doesn't understand a researcher and vice versa. So both have to learn that uh, paradigms of both are different. And what we see is that if you take time to really listen to each other and to that the researcher uh, steps from his pedestal and comes from his, uh, his ivory tower and sees the citizen not as a, as a data point or as, a, as somebody who, who can send in a questionnaire, we see that the connection starts and what citizens find very hard here in Amsterdam is that they have been questioned a lot of time. What do you think of that? This? What do you think of that? So you have to make sure that their questions are also taken up. And if you do that, we see some very good uh, results. So one of the uh, examples I want to mention is that at one point we wanted to measure uh, urban air quality. And uh, so it was a research project with sensors in streets which, which were heavily burdened. And then the citizen says, but please hang that uh, sensor in my living room. So that's where I want to have a clean air in the night. Mm -hmm. So totally new research questions and new modeling uh, uh, emerged to give very detailed modeling of the air quality in our city. So I think that um, I cannot judge on COVID uh, effects, uh, but I think that um, if you really let citizens uh, be engaged on their problems, and with their ideas, that's where the living labs uh, come to fruition. And that's where the researcher starts to see new research topics, which he or she did not think of yet. 
and then it goes, goes really well. And another point which is connected to this is that um, policy is often uh, hindering uh, experiments. So in some of the, the living lab areas, we really have to switch off some of the uh, policies to do the experiments. So go to a rule-free zone uh, and, of course, keep it safe and, and, and data protected. Um, I have two questions matching what you just said. I'm just deciding on which to pose first. Um, I think this one has more votes. So scientists contribute to research for sustainability, but scientists also contribute to global CO2 emissions and other environmental impacts through their work. For example, more than 50% of the CO2 emissions in research is due to air travel to conference only. Well, not to this conference. <laughs> Thus, do we as scientists also need to change our work behavior and apply principles of sustainability also more in our own work in order to serve as a good example for society and politics? Mr. Verhoof. <laughs> but if you see, and also uh, uh, thinking what Ms. Tilbury said, is if you look at the university systems, there are approximately 250 million people involved in universities around the globe, representing, I think, 2% of the world uh, population, or one and a half. So making change in the leaders of the future is a very important thing to do. And that goes uh, from the individual action, so uh, not travel, to the global action. So what are you studying exactly if you're looking, for instance, at uh, shipbuilding uh, studies? Um, and of course, it's easier for, uh, for, for those researchers who have a position already and the professors. For the young ones, it is hard because going to conference is still uh, seen as a, as a thing which you get rewarded for. It's good on your resume. So there is change needed. And um, I see that students are really active. We had a great example earlier this morning. And students are doing this uh, in the Netherlands and around Europe, uh, also connected through the International uh, Sustainable Campus Network. I have another question which um, quite meets with what you said before. Why are certain system changing innovations rejected and others not? The classic is examples are internet, mobile phones, etc. have changed systems and lifestyles. But what about those that would support sustainability but are rejected? Well, the question is what examples he or she is thinking of in, in this case, because I would argue that, um, you know, one, one has to also Despite the scientific unequivocal support that we are in an urgent emergency state, one should recognize that we've made you know, quite remarkable progress over the last 10, 15 years when it comes to you know, shifting over. I mean, I would argue today that it's not a question if we'll have a fossil fuel free world economy, it's just a question, will it happen fast enough? We know that the car industry in the world is moving towards electric mobility and renewable uh, fuel systems. We know that we're moving towards a solar wind driven world energy future. We know that we are moving towards a future where we will uh, you know, reduce drastically our undermining of the life support systems in, in, in the living nature. So it's more the question, the mobile phone came and, and, and came as a quick innovation that was adopted at a short time step. But I think we have to recognize that our transformations to sustainability is a slightly slower pace so far. And now the question is, are we able to ramp up the pace? So I, I wouldn't say that, uh, I wouldn't kind of put that, that comparison straight, straight on its head. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I wouldn't expect us suddenly to have renewable energy in the whole world at the same pace as we get adoption of mobile phones. But just to close to say that one challenge we have is the so-called rebound effect, that many of these more efficient consumer technologies that we see, for example, internet and, and mobile phones and computers, they do reduce at the, at, the, at the kind of unit level, but because they then proliferate at such large volumes, the rebound effect is actually net negative. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. That's why we come back to the need to set targets. Sauri, you wanted to say something. 
Yeah, I wanted to give an example why it's not so easy to take everyone along uh, for sustainability and to make it very concrete. It was two years ago, I was sitting in an Indian taxi and the taxi driver told me, and this is linked to the meat discussion we had before. He said, oh, look, my son now finally arrived in the middle class. And I asked him, so how do you, you know, assess this? And he said, look, because he's, he's now finally able to eat meat once a week. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is we have to be very careful, and this is going back to what Professor Rockström said before, not to have a just European discussion. We see whole economies, take South mm -hmm. Africa as an example, where the majority of the economy is still unfortunately built on coal, gas and other means. This is a major transformation. If we do a, a transformation, which I fully support, I think we have to think a little bit also embedding this globally. Otherwise, some economies will be left behind mm. and we will have massive uh, poverty in other parts of the region. So my belief is we have to um, think a little bit also from the consumer uh, uh, state of different countries. And, you know, who are we to forbid others to have at least the developmental level than other states have? So we have to incentivize positive behavior. And this would be the most difficult part of that transformation. Yeah. Um, I think uh, since we're running out of time again, um, it shows how important this topic is and we can discuss actually for hours. Um, we, I still have a couple of questions on my agenda and I would kindly ask you if your question has not been answered yet, please be so kind and join our panelists in the chat sessions that will start in about 15 minutes. But to draw a conclusion on this um, panel now, um, I would, I would like to ask one final question and ask all of you to really answer briefly. How do we not only go from ambition to action, but how do we make sure that our actions have the impact that is required to reach the 2030 goals? Mm. Starting with you. <laughs> well, it's easy. Listen, listen and follow science. I mean, you, you, need, you need the help of science to set the targets. You need the help of science to put in place the monitoring and, and verification systems. And you need to get the economic policies right so that you measure the right things in terms of the values in society. And, and in the end, I think that packages together towards a science-based transformation. And I think that is what we need to see. Since uh, I cannot see Mrs. Hedegaard at the moment, I will continue with Mr. Erbo. What is uh, your opinion on what do we need to do? Um, in brief, uh, allow the industry uh, to get to work uh, based on a transparent uh, regulatory framework uh, across Europe that does not uh, uh, concern itself around uh, borders. Sauri, do you agree? <laughs> yes, I think what we need is the science as a basis for a fact-based discussion. I think we need to honestly talk about dilemmas that are truly existing um, and really then go jointly in a solution room how this transition can be done shoulder by shoulder and with the right timing, thinking through all these side effects that this will have on other parts of society. Um, and I think we need an attitude of, you know, being more jointly pro something and not when something is decided by politicians and industry follows to have um, you know, again, discussions against what was just decided. So we need more collaboration in the end. Mr. Verhoof, you are nodding, so you agree with uh, what Sauri said. You need to, yes. And uh, doing uh, the real life experiments is, I think, very important. And uh, sharing, fast sharing and interchanging with experience over, uh, over Euro and my field is then in cities. But that's the only way to, to, to get from linear processes and go to a little more maybe chaotic, but also more uh, fruitful uh, way of innovation and finding and distributing the, 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 the best practices much faster than we do now. Daniela, your final words. <laughs> How do we get... Uh to reach the 2030 goals, in your opinion. <laughs> science, is, science is not enough for me. Uh, and I think this is the key goal, the key message I've been trying to communicate today. We need to marry the investment and the effort in science with a 
an understanding and a commitment to social change. So we need to bring these two together. Otherwise, we may know a great deal. We may know how to do it. But the adoption, the scalability very much relies on that broader adoption, which requires engagement of people, engagement of decision makers. And there is also a science to that. There is also a lot of research and learning. There's also pathways that we need to understand better and that we need to utilize to affect this transition. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you to all of our panelists. Um, moving on to our lunch break, so to say, gives you the chance, if your questions have not been answered so far, please use the possibility to chat with our panelists. They will be available for you in about 15 minutes. So from 12.15 to 12.45, you will get the chance to chat with them, um, especially maybe to those who will not be participating also in our workshops. And let me remind you as well, have your say. Please enter your ideas and your views on the questions that are indicated on the right side um, of the streaming window. And we will see each other back at 1 p.m. here with our afternoon workout, uh, workshop sessions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to all our panelists and uh, enjoy your lunch break. Back to our afternoon program. I hope you had a revitalizing break and inspiring discussions with our panelists so far. Driving innovation and shaping the future that relies on teamwork to meet future needs and ideally be one step ahead in the technology curve, it is a prerequisite to keep an open mind, be agile, think outside the box, and to team up with the right people also from different sectors, like we have seen this morning, also from the industry, to inspire and learn from each other. For this reason, we have scheduled a lot of time for interaction today, because despite the extraordinary circumstances we're all in, in times of social distancing, the goal of our conference is to join people and make a difference together. So to tell you more about our idea behind and our goals for the afternoon session, I am now joined on my left, <laughs> by the Director General of the BMBF, Volker Rieke. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And who will be joining us virtually, the Director General Research and Innovation of the EU, Jean-Éric Paquet. Gentlemen, your audience. Thank you, Rat, Mrs. Kind, for your kind invitation. And uh, dear Jean-Éric Paquet, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's session of this conference. The title of the conference, conference is From Ambition to Action. And I'm really impressed to see that there is yet action, action that is expressed by your presence, that is expressed by your active participation, that is impressed by your willingness to, uh, to give impact to the conference paper that will be the result, that will sum up the results of this conference. So I appreciate very much your commitments and I'm really impressed as well about the fact that participants from over 40 countries have joined us today. This is really wonderful and it's wonderful because we need this broad participation from across Europe to achieve our shared goals. And Minister Karliczek, the German Minister for Education and Research, described this goal this morning quite clearly. The goal is a climate neutral, a sustainable and an innovative Europe. But what are the ingredients we need to achieve these goals? Achieving this goal requires sustainable innovation and innovations that enable the sustainable transformation on the, of the way we live, the way we work and we, the way we do our business. Our research and our education policies must therefore focus on the societal impact of innovations and public acceptance for new developments. For Europe, and therefore I'm quite happy to have Jean-Éric Paquet with us today, for Europe this means that we need to formulate, formulate clear shared goals. For example, with regard to the missions under Horizon Europe, the new research program. This means that we need transformative research to develop technologies, 
technological and societal solutions. And this means we need research which takes educational aspects into account and vice versa. So education which considers research aspects. New knowledge needs to spill over in the economy and society quickly and on a large scale. For example, school children, as well as software coders, as well as car mechanics, so everywhere of us, need to know how he, she, how we can contribute to sustainability. Many member states and as well the European Union are making great strides towards making this a reality. Starting in 2021, Horizon Europe will place an even greater focus on the issue of sustainability. 35% of the budget will be used for funding climate research and innovation. But ladies and gentlemen, will these figures alone be a guarantee of success? How can we ensure that Horizon Europe and Erasmus Plus become successful trailblazers for a sustainable Europe? Where do we have knowledge gaps? What new topics and what new funding instruments are necessary? A lot of questions, and you have come here today to think about and beyond all these questions. We want to have an in-depth discussion with you, which is why we have organized these workshops around different priorities areas. And I look very much forward to your proposals and ideas as to how we can make a better, even better use of climate research to make Europe the first climate neutral continent. How we can generate innovations for a resource efficient circular economy. How can we make education for sustainable development a key instrument in Erasmus Plus and in Horizon Europe? And for how we can use novel research approaches to reduce inequalities and strengthen social cohesion in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, please make the most of the opportunity today and get actively involved in our discussions. Make your contributions of the, to the workshops and the conference paper. This is what I, uh, what I uh, ex expect and what I really uh, want to see at the end, that we have uh, uh, results uh, in, in a conference paper that, that can have impact. You see that the Director General of the European Commission is with us, and uh, we, uh, we, the member states, uh, Germany, will, uh, will bring these uh, results into the discussions, into the development, and into uh, the implementation of Horizon Europe. So it's worthwhile the, what, what, you, what you are doing today, and I would, would wish the conference much success. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Mr. Rieke. Monsieur Paquet, c'est à vous. Yeah. You have the word. <laughs> Guten Tag. Hello, everyone. Lieber Volker, thank you very much for this invitation. I, I hear myself. Well, thank you very much for the invitation uh, from the German presidency. I think the, the topic is indeed uh, extremely uh, well chosen and um, very much uh, in line with the work happening in all member states and also um, uh, here in Brussels. We will be driving Europe's recovery around the twin transition, the sustainability green transition and the digital transition. And so to drive that, we need indeed what you said, we need a joined up approach one which allows us to work across policy areas in a whole of government approach, if you want. One which allows us to join up between civil society, industry, public administrations, and one obviously which cannot be delivered at any level if it's not through all the others as well. So you have an internal market dimension, you have national systems, you also have very many local deliverables and work which are necessary. And to bring these topics into um, the setup of your of your conference and in, in, in the panels uh, and in the discussions of the workshop this afternoon, I find that um, this is the, the the right format to discuss these very complex uh, uh, issues, where indeed research and education are two main components: research to provide knowledge, research to provide solutions. Uh, research to provide the basic science, but also the innovation to deliver the outcomes in society. Horizon Europe, of course, uh, 
will be um, uh, one important instrument, but again, not one which can be seen in isolation. It will need to be connected with uh, national, regional, and also other parts of the European uh, toolbox to really have the impact needed. The same goes for education, where certainly uh, Erasmus will, I think, play a big role in bringing the ideas across uh, Europe, out of schools and, and into universities, allowing the skills needed for these transitions to be uh, emerging and to equip citizens to have these skills, digital, of course, but not only, uh, because it is only through education uh, and skills that we can ensure that these transitions are indeed fair and just and that all citizens in Europe can be part of the process of inventing the transition on the one hand, but also benefiting benefiting from these very, very deep changes, these deep transformations which are still ahead of us. So um, I must say uh, bravo, and I'm, a, and I'm also quite uh, excited to see the workshops develop and then have uh, uh, the leaders come back to us in the course of the afternoon with their findings, and I'd be happy then, then to comment and, 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 and come back, uh, including maybe by connecting the outcome of the workshop, as Volker suggested it, with the work happening here in Brussels in preparing Horizon Europe in co-creation with member states, civil society, industry, and other institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rieke, after the motivating statements of the both of you, <laughs> Um, and as well as the discussions from this morning. Um, I'm sure that a sustainable Europe is a leitmotiv in the mind of every one of us. Um, what else would you like to share with our workshop participants before we now start into the sessions and uh, to make especially sure that the sessions do achieve the results we're aiming at? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think there are three p uh, aspects that I would like to underline. The first thing I mentioned it is the conference paper. This is quite an important uh, uh, paper. It's, uh, it can influence the discussions uh, that we have together with uh, our colleagues from the European Commission uh, and uh, the member states and the Commission uh, will take it into account. And so it can have impact and it can have an impact that is really needed. So once again, uh, please use this opportunity uh, today and share your ideas. Uh, this is, I think, a wonderful opportunity to have at the end impact. The second aspect, um, I think it's, it's worthwhile to think about that uh, Horizon Europe and Erasmus Plus, Plus are the last programs that will, will end just before 2030, mm -hmm. so uh, the agenda for sustainable development and the goals that we had, have uh, committed to, uh, to reach to 2030. And so we, you mentioned it this morning, the clock is really ticking. It's a question, it's five minutes or five seconds before 12. And it is no coincidence that we chose these topics for the workshop, scaling innovations and behavioral change. So uh, these are workshops that where we hope that at the end uh, it can deliver prompt and effective solutions for the society as a whole. And we need these solutions to build an innovative and sustainable Europe. We have this momentum that we have the new programs starting and uh, we have the uh, stimulus package, packages in Germany with a lot of new fresh money for investments in sustainable research and innovation. So a lot of possibilities to go ahead and uh, so good, uh, good uh, solutions have, uh, have a really a chance to get funded, to get financed, to get supported and to make a difference. And this is, I think, uh, uh, worthwhile to, to tackle all these topics in these workshops uh, uh, this afternoon. And the third aspect that's, uh, I think, important, uh, and it's a wish um, of mine, uh, please um, uh, think across silos. So I think the complexity of the problems is, is clear to everybody. So everything depends on everything, and a solution can't be a solution just delivering by, delivered by one discipline. So I think it's quite important that scientific, scientists, uh, innovators, researchers, uh, that they work together uh, and in an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way to achieve this goal, to, to give answers to these complex questions. So once again, uh, uh, 
leave the comfort zone. So uh, go ahead, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to the results that will come out of these workshops today, and much success in your work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paquet, is there anything you want to add and hand out to yeah. our workshop participants before we start? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, starting where, where Volker left it, I think what I would like to say is challenge us. Challenge us. Get us out of, the, out of our out of our comfort mm -hmm. zone as well. Uh, and indeed, this means working across policy areas. It means uh, pushing us uh, to look at trade-offs and find uh, systems approach to deal with these trade-offs. Uh, look at uh, how indeed um, packages of solutions can make a deep difference immediately. You are aware that the Commission is now proposing that we reduce CO2 emissions by 55%, not any more 40% as is in the legislation, but 55% by 2030. So we need to make a head start now and, and, and during throughout this decade. And that requires, I think, much more uh, ambitious approaches and to uh, tell us that, yes, technology matters and we will, of course, support it, but social innovation and um, human curiosity-driven skills will be as important. So push us a bit, and I'm very much looking forward to, to see uh, new ideas um, uh, coming out of uh, your discussions. And as Volker said, it, the paper which you will produce will feed straight into the preparations of Horizon Europe. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I would like to briefly introduce you to the workshops that are um, now going to happen. In room number one, we will be having Making Europe Climate Neutral. Our workshop leader is going to be Dr. Frank McGovern. In room number two, we will be having Reversing Inequalities by the workshop leaders, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Olaf Groß-Zamberg and Professor Dr. Imme Scholz. Room number three will be Moving Education Towards Sustainability. The workshop leader here is Professor Arjen Wals. And room number four will be Circular Econom for the SDGs by Bernd Schäfer and Vera Susanne Rotter. So I hope that you all had the chance to find a place in one of the workshops. If not, um, I would like to follow your example. Please, please answer our questions and therefore contribute to the final conference paper. We would kindly ask you to all fill out the questions. You should see them on the right-hand side of uh, your streaming window now. And we will be seeing each other back in three hours with uh, hopefully amazing results from our workshops. And um, we'll provide you, of course, with the insult, uh, insights of the results and uh, hope that these next steps will pave a way for a better and more sustainable future. Thank you very much to the both of you. Let's hope the outcome will be amazing. <laughs>Welcome back and let me just say wow, wow and thank you to all the participants of our workshops. I've been luring into the workshops a little bit and um, thank you for your activity, um, for the vivid participation in our workshops. Um, so to speed things up, in innovation and sustainability a little bit, we invited our workshop hosts here for a little relay race. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And the first question to all of you is, what was the most recurring term or expression in your workshop? And I would say we just start in room number one. Mr. McGovern, what was the most recurring term? <laughs> well, I, I would say the most recurring term was communication, education, and communities. And I'll put those three together for you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Schaefer. <laughs> The uh, most recurrent term for me was sustainable battery value networks. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, Mrs. Schultz. Mrs. Schultz. Olaf. Olaf. It's uh, Olaf's it's turn. Olaf. Okay. And then we still have uh, Olaf there, yes. Oh, and Arjen just uh, joined as well. But Olaf, what was the most recurring term in your workshop? We cannot hear you. We, as long as we solve that technical issue, maybe we ask Arjen, what was the most uh, reoccurring term in your workshop?
Can you hear me, Mr. Walls? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you okay. perfectly. Okay, what was the most recurring term or expression in your... S systemic change was the biggest word that we heard and people were agreeing that uh, just as it cannot be business as usual. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Olaf, you've been in the same course as Imma, right? Uh, so, uh, since Imma already answered, but I want you, of course, to have a word as well. <laughs> yeah, and I solved now the microphone problem. I, I guess you can hear me now. Yes, perfectly. <laughs> yeah. So the most recurring words were inequality and sustainability and the intersection and interlinkages between inequality and sustainability. That was the core topic. All right, thank you. And Vera, what were the terms that occurred most in your workshop? Yeah, uh, I was in the same session like Dan Schiff. Unfortunately, I missed his input, uh, but um, we, specifically regarding research, it was cross-sectoral and inter-transdisciplinary um, aspects. So was there anything that surprised you in particular, starting again with Mr. McGovern? <laughs> surprise, well, the main surprise was the lack of surprise, I think, and that we're taking as an indication that mm -hmm. we're going in the right direction with our research and innovation planning. And I suppose the other thing is Going back to that communication issue, the need for clarity, clarity on science, clarity on policy for citizens and stakeholders, including large scale investors and people and enabling that, enabling that, that there are systematic barriers to this, that basically science, scientists are rewarded for doing science, not communication. We should think about that. Thank you. So addressing room number two, so uh, Mr. Gro Samberg and Mrs. Schultz, uh, who wants to answer the question? Maybe you lift your hand, okay, Mrs. Schultz. Um, yeah. What did surprise you? <laughs> well, we discussed a lot the, re the relationship between uh, science or research and communication, but the surprising result was we talked a lot about positive imaginaries, and uh, narratives, so to be able to link research with um, wider communication processes with the public, but also with policymakers and other stakeholders. And the other surprising thing was the global perspective. So look beyond Europe, uh, look at the impacts Europe is having on other societies, but also at innovative approaches to reducing inequalities uh, in other continents and uh, include that in our research here in Europe. Thank you, yes, uh, that also was part of our panel discussion in the afternoon. Uh, Mr. Walsh, what did surprise you in particular? Well, um, you know, whereas there was a lot of talk about green economy today and responsible innovation, blended learning, digitalization, lots of terms that people seem to agree on, the surprise maybe to me is that um, what, what I found absent, but this is personal, is there was not a lot of talk about uh, connecting with nature. The more ecological dimension seems to have lost a little bit in the mm -hmm. conversation and the emotional connecting with the world around us, with other species, the local place. Um, that is kind of lost in all the innovation talk. And so that would be was a bit of a surprise. And it, I think it's important that we bring it back as an essential part of sustainability. Thank you. And room number four, who will be answering the question? Uh, is it Mr. Schaefer or Mrs. Rotter? You can raise your hand or yeah. just unmute yourself, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, what surprised me is actually there were many actors involved in research and they all um, actually claimed for a new type of research. So it's a, um, that uh, they, they, there was a clear understanding that uh, um, the, the research that had been done so far should, should, it should go beyond that. 
Um, maybe one additional aspect was also then that surprised me that there were some participants are also looking at beyond Europe and, and, and how to integrate a view specifically on circular economy and global flows uh, beyond Europe, naming China as an example where many things are already in place. And uh, I think maybe we also have to discuss this um, type of different actors on global flows um, as well. Thank you. So, Mr. McGovern, your topic was making Europe climate neutral. What will be the next steps for your topic after the conference? Well, I, I suppose, obviously, the, there's going to be a paper to provided from the conference, but I think the concepts, there's a great deal of interesting concepts that were discussed there, which I, as chair of JPI Climate, will bring back to the governing board of JPI Climate. The key issue for me was, Basically, people are buying into this transition. People want to do this transition. We need to provide them with the solutions. And conceptually, we need to find a way of overcoming the systemic barriers that we have there, including enabling science to communicate, addressing the gaps, major gaps in our understanding of how to respond, and meeting those targets, enabling that transition with all stakeholders from citizens, to policymakers. Thank you very much. And in room number two, you were talking about reversing inequalities. Um, who wants to answer the next steps? Okay, Olaf, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we, we also had a very lively uh, discussion um, and we identified a lot of core topics that we need to elaborate on. We also talked a lot about the relation between research and policy recommendation or, or, or public impact and also identified the need for maybe um, a better division of labor or, or a better training because we have sometimes excellent researchers, but uh, the communication of our findings to the general public is very difficult and needs uh, specialized skills as well. So this is maybe one route of action uh, to think about more about um, professional communication uh, actors um, that transfer the research results into the broader public. But we will all put that in a conference paper as well. <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. Um, Mr. Walsh, moving education towards sustainability. <clears throat> your next steps, apart from putting it into the paper. <laughs> Unmute yourself, please. <laughs> Already unmuted. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's fine. We I, hear you. Yeah. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Well, one thing that, that most people seem to agree on is that we need a whole institution approach to sustainability or a whole school approach when it concerns schools, where we integrate sustainability more systemically in the curriculum, but also in school community relationships and in also new pedagogies, new forms of learning, where we develop new com competencies and capacities in learners that have to do with dealing with complexities, thinking more holistically, anticipating different kinds of futures, also dealing with emotions and strong uh, anxiety, how can we have hopeful futures? And this requires also new professional development of teachers. Question is, how do we connect schools and universities to the to the all the kind of initiatives that are happening in the community? How can we connect schools and universities to to these uh, pockets of innovations that are all around us, but that we're not tapping into much, and vice versa. How can we bring sustainability to to education? So it's it's a, a kind of a combination to create synergy between society, science, school, community, the world of work, but also the world of governance. And lastly, one thing that we talked about is maybe we should have specific funding for education for sustainable development within Erasmus Plus, where certain projects are earmarked to focus on sustainability locally, but where we tap into the diversity that we have within Europe, where people from different places can help realize local sustainability. Thank you, yes. And talking about the uh, SDGs, uh, I think it will be Mr. Schäfer now answering <laughs> the next steps. 
Yeah, I think the uh, next steps, we just launched the, land, the next step last week. And, and this means we as CIT Raw Materials, we have uh, launched the Initiative for European Raw Materials Alliance, which clearly addresses not only um, the raw material value chains, but also the circular economy needs. And in this context, definitely we are addressing the right things for a topic that is being mirrored today in the context of the traction batteries. I think session one highlighted this very nicely. Uh, that there is a systemic and life cycle oriented view on um, battery circularity and uh, this will be key of course to enable the successful implementation uh, of circular economy. Uh, I think the interactions that are needed here between the automotive and battery manufacturing industry with other sectors like the energy, digital and mobility sectors are a nice example and, and they exist of course. Uh, in this respect batteries are a prime example of uh, systemic transition and systemic transition needs that we face in all these sectors and, and how cross-sectoral benefits can be created using the same material for other sectors. It's a nice example for circular economy. We are addressing this on various sectors, so we have very specific next steps here that go beyond the battery lives, but also addressing other industries. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you all for your time, um, especially also to our audience, of course, for your amazing participation, for your great ideas, for your fantastic input in our workshops and, of course, to the six of you for your time and for spending the afternoon with us. Thank you very much. So, um, I hope Mr. Paquet is already online as well. I can see his name, but I cannot yet see his face. But there he is. <laughs> Perfect. So um, it's been a very busy day, a very busy afternoon. <clears throat> Have your expectations for this afternoon been met? Shall I start? Yes. Um, well, I, I, of course, I, I was not in the various workshops, but I listened to the very um, diverse and, and, and interesting uh, uh, snapshots which were given now by the moderators. Thank you very much for that. I think it illustrates, uh, I mean, firstly, the um, extreme uh, diversity of uh, actions uh, and challenges which we are uh, facing, um, and this diversity, which is also for policymaker a marker of complexity, needs indeed a, a very, uh, I think, different approach to, to tackle, different approach to, to tackle. I think the first thing which is needed is indeed a very broad engagement with society, not just with stakeholders, but also with society. It then requires um, systems uh, changes and systems thinking. I think this came across quite strongly. And I think on top of that, it will require also that we agree to, um, how shall I put it, uh, to also move a little bit out of uh, traditional recipes um, and traditional areas of uh, priorities in research to embark on uh, indeed um, uh, trying to find uh, ways of, uh, of identifying research topics um, which are much more cross-cutting, allowing the systems approach to really emerge. And that uh, change management, that change process, I think is really what now needs to be managed. Uh, with, uh, with vision and sustainability, I think, is indeed the right yardstick uh, for that vision. And um, I hope that we can, uh, from that, uh, also as we at European level prepare Horizon Europe, that we will indeed be able to keep what has been impactful and what is uh, consistent with the new needs, but then create enough space to address these new, challenging, these new challenges in this uh, very broad complexity. All that to say that uh, this is not going to be particularly easy, uh, but having the benefit of your input will no doubt help. And uh, we need to remain very transparent and very open to, uh, to have um, input um, and expectations voiced uh, across the entire spectrum from civil society to politicians, including then, of course, uh, also industry, to try to get the recipe right. Thank you. Thank you very much, and again, thank you to all our workshop leaders. Um, thank you for your time and, uh, of course, for your amazing input. So, um, Mr. Rieke, I am from Nuremberg, and I don't want to talk about the latest performance of our football team, but in football, we normally say after the match is before the match. What are the next steps after today's conference 
for you and where will the next match take place? <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful picture. Thank you for this question. First of all, I would like to thank, as you did before, uh, to the, uh, express my thanks to the workshop organizers and, uh, of course, as well to the participants for their very valuable contributions. It's, uh, from my perspective, first of all, it's uh, remarkable that the whole research community is rising to the challenge of achieving a climate-neutral Europe, and this is, uh, is a strong force uh, that we have behind us, and this uh, makes me feel quite optimistic. Numerous courses of action and numerous tools for reaching our, our object, objective to get new, CO2 neutral in 2050 have been mentioned, have been discussed. As uh, Jean-Éric mentioned, a lot of research topics were discussed. For example, approaches and ideas for smart and holistic circular systems I think circular economy is just more than just recycling. It, it's, it's needed to have a system, a systemic, holistic perspective in this field, and this is crucial, and this has to be taken into account by setting up uh, systemic research projects like missions. And the dig digital battery passport, as one example that has been discussed, is an interesting proposal as well. Another aspect that I found uh, not really surprising, but it, that's worthwhile to be pointed out, is the question of the professionalization of the communication of scientists vis-a-vis -vis politicians, vis-a-vis -vis the society, vis-a-vis -vis industry. Uh, I think the corona crisis shows the importance of a good communication. You can see uh, that all political leaders in our country, that's what I know best, uh, listen to the different, to the different uh, voices, of course they are different, uh, voices of scientists, and uh, on, this they, uh, on this basis they uh, decide on measures and implement measures uh, to overcome this pandemic. And I think it's a wonderful example, climate IPCC, uh, climate uh, um, consulting by scientists, uh, for the politicians uh, is another example. This shows the importance, uh, the, the, impor the important societal role that science can, can achieve. And uh, I think the momentum is good. The acceptance of politicians, they know the, the there is no easy solution. Complex systems ask for complex answers, for co complex research findings. And therefore, I think it's a, it's a wonderful momentum for researchers to get involved, to get accepted. Uh, and of course, what's needed is a better communication that this is as well a goal, not just to have findings, scientific findings, but as well to communicate these findings in an appropriate, appropriate way to the society, uh, to politicians uh, and to industry. A third aspect that's I think obvious and very important is the importance of education. It has been mentioned. This is really important uh, with regard to this goal to reach the SDGs and as well uh, with regard to resolving conflicts between different objectives. I think um, we need this systemic integration of uh, sustainability in our education system due to the fact that young people, they are the harbor and they have an enormous potential to play an active role today in developing innovation solutions for sustainable development. So have a focus on the young people. Uh, I think this was something that we discussed very early this morning. Uh, so I'm quite, uh, quite in favor to look more on, in particular on Erasmus+, Plus, which offers I think a lot of um, funding possibilities where this aspect to strengthen sustain, uh, sustainability within the education part uh, of uh, funding is important. So you ask me uh, what's the next step and this picture is, uh, is, is very nice. Uh, I think the ball now is in, in our field means BMBF will document and summarize all the results in, this, in, in a conference paper and then we share this conference paper uh, with the workshop participants first to enable a certain feedback. 
Later, we then will share this paper across Europe, for example, with the European Commission, and therefore I'm happy that Jean-Éric Paquet is here with us today, and of course with the member states uh, and uh, with uh, the conference participants as well. So uh, the con conference paper will contain, at the end, new ideas to help and to strengthen sustainable development in Europe further. Our aim is, once again, to make Europe the first climate-neutral continent and a global leader in sustainability. And the next match, you now have the balls in your hand, and then the ball will go to? This is a wonderful picture, <laughs> because Portugal has a strong tradition in football as well. The ball goes to Portugal, which uh, uh, is the next uh, council presidency. Uh, and I uh, would like uh, to say hello uh, to Professor Elena Pereira. She is the president of the Portuguese Foundation of Science and Technology. So promoting sustainable development in, is one of the priorities of the trio presidency of Germany, Portugal, Portugal and Slovenia. I l I'm looking forward to learn more about Portugal's plans for the first half of 2021 regarding sustainable development and the role of education and research. Professor Pereira, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. And hello to everyone. Good afternoon. It is, in fact, a pleasure to participate in the closing of this most successful European forum, as we could see by the highlights of the conclusions for the different sessions. <clears throat> The key aspects for this forum are already in its title, sustainability and science and education, both clearly associated. The overarching framework is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted by all UN member states in 2015, aiming to provide peace and prosperity for the people and the planet for the current and future generations. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals clearly address issues that society recognizes as determining. No poverty, good health and well-being, quality education, to cite a few as examples, for which an active commitment and solidarity are needed and in which science and education play a key role. Europe has set the European Green Deal as an umbrella strategy from the European Commission to implement the SDGs, with the big goal of Europe becoming the first climate-neutral continent by 2015. And strategies have to take into account two key transition contexts with an enormous impact in our present and future world, climate, and digital transformation of our societies. To guide such transition processes, we need to increase our production and use of knowledge, and also to involve citizens and propose intervention solutions. One question could be asked, should funding programs become more focused on applied research and top-down topics instead of bottom-up approaches so that societal change challenges like sustainable development should be addressed? Well, we think that both approaches are necessary. On the one hand, basic research is also needed, and scientific <clears throat> breakthroughs often emerge like that, as well as it's being the basis for future applied research. We see in Horizon Europe pre instruments of excellency like the uh, ERC and MSCA which are bottom-up oriented, as well as instruments which are more focused on societal challenges and have a targeted design, namely through the new partnerships and missions. And what should be the role of research institutions and researchers in the involvement of citizens and the civil society in addressing transversal issues such as sustainable development? We believe that citizen science is crucial for achieving the sustainability goals, not only because they have a close link with everyday life, but also because the implementation of initiatives and the production of medium and long-term changes largely depends on the behavioral change from citizens. 
be it in their private or professional life. As we have been witnessing during the present pandemic crisis, trust in science and in policies are crucial for addressing the challenges. Several citizen science initiatives have been emerging for the past decades, but it is vital that researchers define a structured outreach plan for their research projects on a broader basis. This may include the direct involvement of stakeholders throughout the research activities, for instance, focus groups, surveys or interviews, turning them into agents of data collection, cite a few examples, but also a plan to disseminate and communicate results for different audiences. For that, research units and research uh, uh, structures should have specialized teams to do such demanding tasks. Let us not forget the young people as the crucial element of change. And I would like to highlight here the project Plastic Pirates, which is a joint citizenship campaign initiative implemented in the context of the Council of EU's Presidency Trio, Germany, Portugal and Slovenia, aimed at children and school-age youth with the aim of mapping and combating pollution from plastic and marine litter in Europe's rivers and seas. Let me say some words about the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the EU coming next semester. One of the five main priorities is on a green Europe, which will seek to promote a greater level of ambition and action at global level, in particular with regard to tackling climate change, upholding decarbonization, halting biodiversity loss, and promoting the preservation of environmental systems, including the oceans. For instance, the following events will be organized during this semester the Arctic Sum Summit Week, the Climate Science from Space, the Conference on Sustainable Oceans. During the period of the BT Presidency, the Quimbra Sustainability Conference 2021 will also take place with the goal of demonstrating that Green Deal and digital transformation are two sides of the same coin. The conference will focus on four pillars public policy and regulation in European digital market, education and training, involvement of small and medium enterprises in the innovation process, and uh, the adoption of innovative technologies by SMEs. Let me finish by stressing that researchers are pillars for knowledge creation and their dissemination and use. A strong commitment to an European dimension of the research careers will be taken during the PT presidency, enhancing the uh, already uh, efforts that are being made. And by that, uh, we will try to enhance the recognition and value of the research careers, the mobility at regional level, as well as intersectorial. As always, people will make the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pereira. Um, Mr. Paquet, what do you expect from the coming year and also from the Portuguese EU Council presidency in terms of sustainability? Since uh, the German, Portuguese and Slovenian trio presidency is picking up uh, what we have now uh, promoted in two policy papers, which is to connect the European research area on the one hand and the European education area on the other hand. So very much what you have done during the event today and give those two broader policy visions a direction and the direction is all about sustainability. So I'm very much looking forward to still fully benefit from these three remaining months with our German presidency and then get um, uh, with Elena and her teams into, into really trying to operationalize this uh, deep connection between these two policy areas. As we discussed throughout the days, it's across policies, across sectors, that we get to the systemic thinking which allows sustainability to effectively happen. So uh, a, a lot to be uh, expected next year and then um, next year into the Portuguese and Slovenian presidency. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Rieke, what are your thoughts with regard to the Portuguese EU Council presidency? First of all, 
like to express my thanks to Professor Pereira for her uh, keynote address. I'm sure the issue of a sustainable Europe and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development will be in very good hands during the Portuguese presidency. And of course, it's great that the EFSIS conference won't be a one-off event, but it will be continued. It's like a blockbuster in the cinema. What's good comes back. This is an, as well an excellent example for European cooperation for sustainable development. So there are high expectations for the 2021 Sustainability Conference in Coimbra, Portugal, and of the results that come out of this conference. And I would like to, to say goodbye to Professor Pereira and as well to Jean-Éric Paquet. I'm, thank you for your active participation and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Bye-bye. Thank okay, you very much. Nice. Bye. Yes, Mr. Rieke, we have reached the end of our conference here. Your final message to our participants. My final message can only be thank you. Thank you to organizers of the conference. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you to all the participants who actively participated in this conference, who brought their ideas uh, in, into the discussion. And now uh, gives, that gives us now the opportunity uh, to have an impact uh, on the um, development of further research policy in, in Europe and, of course, uh, as well in, in Germany. So thanks a lot for all your thoughts, for, for, your, for your input. Uh, and, of course, I'm, I'm really thrilled by, uh, and it's overwhelming for me, to see this number of participants from all over Europe. As I've learned 800 participants uh, in the morning, about 250 participants uh, in the workshops. And uh, I think this is an excellent uh, result. And this is a high responsibility for us, for the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. We look carefully to the results that uh, were produced in the workshops, and we will try to finalize it by this um, conference paper, and we come back to you so that you have another chance to, to uh, give us a feedback, and then we uh, work hard that uh, this day and your thoughts uh, get implemented in our agendas uh, and the rest is once again goodbye to all participants. Uh, I wish you a wonderful evening and stay health. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Well, driving change and innovation is teamwork, and we are in this together. And together we are in it to win it. So please go out there, take the results and your learnings from today, be an ambassador for a more sustainable Europe, and also motivate others and spread the word. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much for inviting me. Have a safe trip home and you stay healthy. Thank you very much.